did I get the job? Absolutely not. Why not? Because you're a baby boomer and I am a millennial. Most Gen Xers are in school during the crash. So at first, they think like, so what? I am a Gen Xer. But I came to find out that actually the term Generation X, it has no meaning. How is eating meat racist? I'll gladly tell you. Looks like we've got an oppressor on our hands. The millennials in Generation Z have the Peter Pan syndrome. They don't ever want to grow up. Maybe they belong to school, you didn't do anything. While there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else. And yet you're stealing their future in front of their very eyes. You're going to mature and you're going to realize nothing's free that things aren't equal, and that your utopian society you created in your mind in your youth simply is not sustainable. Okay, Boomer, listen up. Generational conflict is back. Boomers have stolen millennials' future. They've used up scarce resources while voting for austerity. For their part, millennials are self-absorbed avocado scoffers who rather complain than work and save. Where once the young rebels of the 1960s stuck it to the man, and by extension their parents' generation, today it's the turn of the young to challenge that very same 60s generation, now grown old, retired, and complacent. It's they who mortgaged our future. Didn't they? This is the growing narrative of generationalism. The belief that all members of a given generation possess characteristics specific to that generation, which make it inferior or superior to another. Our turbulent times at the end of the end of history are generating new cleavages and conflicts, and the Generation War is one of the most prominent across the West. Welcome to OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations, a special five-part series by Aufe Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. As you're probably aware, a whole popular literature has emerged blaming baby boomers for our situation. Hey, yo. Hey, yeah. This one goes out to all the 65-plus crowd on SoundCloud. Not gonna say much. Shout out Jed Will. He gonna take over on the mic. Old ladies suck. Okay, boomer. 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 Okay. Here are just some titles. What did the baby boomers ever do for us? A generation of sociopaths. How the baby boomers betrayed America. Boomers, the men and women who promised freedom and delivered disaster. The age of entitlement. America since the 60s. When the boomers fail, how demographics will sort communities into winners and losers. The theft of a decade, how the baby boomers stole the millennials' economic future. The pinch, how the baby boomers took their children's future and why they should give it back. And, okay boomer, let's talk, how my generation got left behind. The phrase okay boomer even made it into a parliamentary debate in New Zealand. In the year 2050, I will be 56 years old. Yet, right now, the average age of this 52nd parliament is 49 years old. Okay, Boomer. Uh, current political institutions. In turn, there's a whole literature alternately fawning over, blaming, or pitying millennials. iGen, why today's super connected kids are growing up less rebellious, more tolerant, less happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood, and what that means for the rest of us. Generation Me, why today's young Americans are more confident, assertive, entitled, and more miserable than ever before. The gaslighting of the millennial generation, how to succeed in a society that blames you for everything gone wrong. Kids these days, human capital and the making of millennials. Can't even, how millennials became the burnout generation. Young, broke, and educated, a discussion of millennials, finance, economics, and poverty. Millennials, the so-called entitled generation. The war on millennials, airing grievances and offering solutions through the eyes of America's next generation of leaders. The AOC generation, how millennials are seizing power and rewriting the rules of American politics. And how not to become a millennial, learning from America's largest sociological disaster. Not to be forgotten, 
Generation X, a generation squished between boomers and millennials, have something to say for themselves too. Of course there's Generation X, Tales for an Accelerated Culture, but also the silent revolution of Generation X, Zero Hour for Gen X, How the Last Adult Generation Can Save America from Millennials, X Saves the World, How Generation X Got the Shaft But Can Still Keep Everything from Sucking, and Passed Over and Pissed Off, The Overlooked Leadership Talents of Generation X. And of course, the very young are a problem unto themselves, but they haven't done much yet, so they only merit a placeholder name, Generation Z, in titles such as Generation Z Unfiltered, facing nine hidden challenges of the most anxious population, Generation We, the power and promise of Gen Z, Gen Z, the superhero generation, Generation Z, the zombie generation, OK Gen Z, the true generation, meet Generation Z, understanding and reaching the new post-Christian world, Generation Brave, the Gen Z kids who are changing the world, yeah this one has Greta on the cover, and Hollowed Out, a warning about America's next generation. What's behind this upswell in generational thinking? Millennials are regularly cast as entitled and self-indulgent. But these are the exact terms by which boomers were criticized by the existing adult leadership of society in the 1960s. And yes, earlier generations might have had access to lower house prices and university fees, but does that mean all boomers became university-educated homeowners? Hardly. And on the other hand, millennials do indeed face real difficulties. They entered the workforce just as steady, long-term job contracts were evaporating. But they're evaporating for everyone. What leads people to feel themselves part of their generation? Why do people come to see society in generational terms at some points in history, and not in others? In this series, we aim to explore how the concept of youth and of generations emerged in the 19th and early 20th centuries, before turning to examine, in order, baby boomers, born 1945 to 1964, Generation X, born 1965 to 1980, and finally, millennials, born 1981 to 1996, not forgetting, of course, Gen Z, born 1997 onwards. An examination of this historical trajectory suggests four separate insights. Here are the first three of these. 1. History can be told through the story of various generations' life course, as, for example, the boomers went from being hippie students denouncing the war in Vietnam to urging on quote-unquote humanitarian bombing raids on poor countries in the 1990s. Two. Generational consciousness emerges at different points in time, without any predetermined regularity. This consciousness is the product of certain formative experiences. 3. Generations are not just passive. They're defined by more than just their consumption patterns or what they went through as kids and young adults. They can also be defined by what they do, by their political agency. What picture emerges when we compare generations across a longer history? Comparing contemporary Russia to French Sixtieet and Weimar youth is this role of um, the foundational experience of a particular generation. So in Weimar youth, that experience of the First World War, the contradictory experiences of how one lived through the First World War and what that has left as an imprint on young people's own identity kind of 20 years on. Felix Kravacek, a political scientist at the Center for East European and International Studies, who researches the role of youth in politics. In France 68, it's kind of similar. We've got a really incredibly important foundational experience for these young people being the Second World War. And then 20 years later, how do you position yourself towards that historical experience that was, you know, where your parents were involved, where your father was most likely to be at the front and your mom was at home, also involved in one way or another in the war effort. Similar again, of course, in, in Germany and in, in the Weimar Republic with this kind of, okay, how did my parents go through that? So it's the foundational experience a generation later, more or less, 20 years after that, the end of that event. How do you position yourself to that, which is an element of negotiating your own biography in your family? So how, what, who am I? Am I a son of a collaborator family in France or were my parents involved in heroically fighting the resistance and for the true French spirit? That's a really important question if you're in your 
20s and you want to know who you are. But what I found interesting to add to that, and that's been drawing kind of from working on the Russian case, is that the perspective backwards to the past event really only has meaning if it's combined with a perspective to the future, kind of where do we want to go as a generation. And in the Russian case, that was really staggering in the speeches that were addressed to young people linking the Second World War to, you know, what we want to be as Russia in 20, 30 years time. And it's your role now as young people to make that Russia become a reality. And actually a similar dynamic exists in the Weimar Republic and French 68 about discussions about the future. What do we want to be as Weimar? Where do we want to go as France? And what I find really interesting in the Weimarian case, for instance, is that these debates about the future of the Weimar Republic were just so fragmented and youth was so polarized in the different camps and so heavily ingrained in these partisan struggles that young people's political involvement in a way made a contribution to the fragility of the Weimar Republic and kind of to make this palpable. There were youth movements who fought very energetically for the Republic, for this kind of the idea of democracy and free elections and voice to the parliament and so on and so forth. But at the same time, young people were equally involved in kind of the early fascist national socialist movements and the communists. And then there was also quite an important part of young people who were involved in the church. And in these four fractions, they also all had very different and competing ideas about where the country should be going to. And they link that back to their experience or their interpretation of what they've learned from the First World War. In the Weimar case, what is, I think, important there to understand the regime breakdown is that these fractions of young people, in a way, they were endorsed by adult civil society, by adult political engagement. So they all had kind of adult allies. And therefore, the struggle of youth was no longer only a struggle of youth, but became part of kind of the general confront political confrontations in the country. Um, and then, of course, we know how the story ends, which fraction had the most influence. And that was different in France, 68. And that's, I think, where the comparison is quite illuminating, because in France, the struggle of youth was always contained up to a certain point, but was seen as a youth problem. It's kind of a, you know, adolescence issue of... It's a problem with the university. The university system isn't adequate enough. And yes, there were, of course, moments of solidarity with the workers. Obviously, there were huge marches where workers joined students. But these were more kind of occasional, even though they were really important and the general strike was large. But that could not have that kind of broader momentum that, we, that we've seen in the Weimar Republic. So in France, eventually, kind of the success was limited also of 68, I think, because that generation was seen as speaking for a generation rather than for society overall. And that's quite different to what we've seen in Weimar, where, yes, the young generation had a particular view because of their socialization experiences and kind of views on the future. But at the same time, they were not seen as being particularly speaking only for youth, which is, I think, a really important difference and an interesting factor in understanding how young people's activism is positioned in society, where it can be dismissed as, you know, well, it's a problem with the new generation. They just need to learn and be accustomed to our rules and then it will all be fine. Versus, gosh, this isn't just a problem of youth. This is our society that is facing certain problems and that we need to address. Une théorie qui est inscrite au fronton des sociétés, la liberté, l'égalité, la traversée, 
la guerre au Vietnam, et court le massacre en Algérie. Et court le massacre en Algérie. What Kravatsak said at the end there is important, about seeing things in generational terms versus seeing them as social problems. And it brings us to our fourth and final hypothesis to be explored in this series. Generationalism, the perceiving of social problems through the lens of generational conflict, is often problematic, for it might obscure other, more fundamental divisions and social forces, such as class. Thinking in terms of generations might have some worth when applied to questions of values, Values are transmitted through society, through cultural reproduction, that is, especially through the institutions of the family and education. A generation can come to see itself as different from that which preceded it, because it comes to hold values that conflict with those of its parents, for example. But does it make sense to think in generational terms when discussing material questions of interests, wealth, production, ownership, and so on? Before we get there, let's begin at the beginning, with a bit of theory. At a basic level, what is a generation? We might take the idea for granted, but when we examine it a bit more deeply, it seems awfully slippery. After all, we can barely agree on whether millennials are young 20-something girls dancing on TikTok, or if they're 40-something dad bod dads in front of a barbecue. So to set us off on the right path, we spoke to Jenny Bristow, a sociologist at Canterbury Christchurch University, and the author of a number of books on generations, including Baby Boomers and Generational Conflict, and most recently, The Corona Generation, co-written with her teenage daughter. We start with the most fundamental of questions. Are generations biological or social? It's both. And uh, the interesting thing about generations for social scientists is that it really does compel looking at both sides of that question. My work on generations began actually through my work on parenting culture. And it would be absurd to say that generations don't mean anything in the family, kinship, natural, biological sense. Um, and that's also very important in terms of thinking about processes of generational transmission, because it's the fact that you've got new people coming into the world all the time that kind of gives this sense of dynamism and ongoing continuity and change and sometimes friction. But I'm a sociologist, um, generation isn't just a natural phenomenon. It is also something that we give meaning to as a society. And also that people coming into the society, the new participants in our world, also bring their own new meaning to society. So I think as a concept, it is quite a tricky one to work with. It's, it's quite broad. It is used in different disciplines, has different meanings. People disagree about it. But I think there is something quite uh, important about this concept as a way of situating the relationship between the natural and the social, and also situating the, the relationship of the individual to history and the making of history and the process of meaning making. That being the case, the question then becomes, at what point in history did generations emerge? Well, some would say that it goes back to the ancient Greeks, and certainly there is a, a discussion about um, generations you know, in the ancient world. You also see it in the Bible, you see it in Shakespeare. It's not a new concept in that sense. Where it starts to achieve more sociological significance really comes about with the process of industrialization. Industrialization brings a new sense of time emerging, where you have uh, a tension emerging between family time, the kind of natural cycles of life, um, and the ways that people kind of live and reproduce it themselves in quite distinct kind of communities, with this sort of different sense of social time, and um, a real kind of break from that, that sense of people living in particular kind of closed communities, and having a more kind of uh, universal um, aspiration to participate in society. And something that, you know, with industrialization, it breaks that sort of naturally defined sense of who you are in society. You know, you, you kind of have young people emerging, but they become the products of society and they start engaging with society as themselves, as opposed to just as fathers and sons and, you know, within their particular groups. As the radical Austrian psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich explained, 
The character structures, which correspond to a certain historical situation, are formed in early childhood and are much more conservative than the forces of technical production. It follows that, as time goes on, the psychological structures lag behind the development of the social conditions from which they stemmed and which progress rapidly. Therefore, they come into conflict with the later forms of living. This is the fundamental essence of so-called tradition, that is, the conflict between the old and the new social situation. Reich's positing of a lag between psychological structures that are products of upbringing and accelerating social conditions is worth pondering in light of another related question. What social forces generate social cleavages, specifically generational cleavages? Well, this is something that is kind of quite contested and it, it, it does really depend what theory of generations you um, adopt. So there's various approaches, even within social science. I mean, some people talk about cohorts, which is where you, you would look at a society and sort of slice it up, looking at that kind of group of people born at a particular time. I think that's fine, but I don't think that actually pertains to generations. The approach that I tend to use is inspired by the work of Karl Mannheim, the Hungarian sociologist who wrote very famously in the 1920s about the problem of generations. And what he said was that uh, what gives rise to a generation is a shift in the wider social forces. And he talked particularly about the, the sort of accelerated tempo of, of social change. When something happens, like a war, you could say, certain moments over the 20th century, uh, I've, I've applied this kind of understanding to, for example, this discussion about the 60s. And then arguably you can say the, the current experience we're having of the pandemic um, has really got that potential where suddenly you, know, you get a shift from kind of the present to the future. It's, it's like a jump. And what you see is not the world changing overnight, but the acceleration of a lot of trends that have been going on for a while, which really come to the fore. And it, it creates a different kind of sense of reality, I think, between those who've made themselves, they've achieved their sense of self, their sense of consciousness in the world before, if you like, and then those who are coming into a new world. And that's how you get potentially a kind of a clash between generations, a different kind of generational consciousness. So the sequence from one generation to the next isn't an automatic cyclical process, but is instead caused by certain formative experiences or traumatic historical events. I mean, there are generation theorists who, who see kind of generational change very much in a, a cyclical way, something that's almost like predestined and that follows this sort of natural rhythm of things. Um, and to me, that's not satisfactory because I think we are social beings as well as natural ones. And when we're looking at generational change, often what we're really looking at is history, you know, but we're looking at the people who are part of that history at the time that they're living it. By consequence, it would seem some generations are more of a generation than others, which is to say, some generations have more self-consciousness of themselves as a generation than others do. So Mannheim said that it was these kind of wider social events that gave rise to a generation, a sort of a sense of a generation. But that doesn't necessarily correlate to what people think when they look back and they look back at the 60s generation, for example, or the First World War generation. Because within those moments, obviously, the, the people who develop their formative experiences work them up in different ways. You know, my, my favourite example is actually, if you look at the baby boomer generation, the, the 60s generation, you know, you had uh, Bill Clinton and George Bush on very different ends of the kind of political spectrum, um, seen to represent very different things. But they were part of the same generation in terms of time. And Mannheim's argument was that what happens is that when you have a lot of tension going on in particular historical moments, it gives rise to what he termed generation units. And the generation units, so these distinct groups within a generation that seem then to kind of embody the spirit of that time. And the generation unit that becomes dominant is the one that most chimes with the zeitgeist. In the spirit of the age. So that's why 
if we think about the First World War generation, for example, we think about the poets, you know, Wilfred Owen and Sigrid Sassoon, they really kind of represented that dis disenchantment with the old order uh, that came to be you know, more widely shared as history developed, but they didn't necessarily represent the experience of everybody born at that time or the way that everybody thought about it. So it's complicated. It's also an interaction, not between, not just between young people and the time that they're living in, but then between the future and the past, you know, in terms of how we then come to look back on the world that we've created. These generation units that come to stand for a generation as a whole often have their experience given voice to by intellectuals. Intellectuals that aren't always part of the generation in question. What's quite interesting is that they're all rather old when <laughs> When you, when you look back at uh, some of the, the kind of intellectuals associated with, say, the 60s, you know, you had, for example, uh, Mark Hooser, you know, who wasn't a young man, but his sort of view of the world really came to sort of chime with that, mo that idea of the 60s, and that seemed to be a, a sort of an inspiration. There's an inter interesting discussion that the historian Arthur Marwick has about the 1930s, and the uh, the attraction of people like T. S. Eliot and the modernists for youth at that time, because youth at that time was really kind of disenchanted and you know quite cynical um, about the future, and and those kind of intellectual aspirations kind of became their their muse. In my work on, I mean, thinking more recently about the millennials. I'm always very struck by the, the people claiming to be the voice of youth, the voice of millennials, are usually quite a lot older than the millennials themselves, you know. So it, it is one of those things where it's not, I mean, I don't like to use the word authentic because what we are dealing with here is to a, a large degree, like construction, interpretation, and, you know, something that's much bigger than just young people themselves. But I think it is very interesting to see this interplay between particular intellectual currents and then how that becomes taken on board, if you like, by people coming of age at that time. Who's the voice of the millennial generation? Is it uh, novelist Sally Rooney or Lena Dunham? <laughs> we'll come back to this question in the fifth and final episode of this series. For now, though, we should just note that the idea of a neat, almost automatic succession of generations is a myth. And yet some still hold to this school of thought, to the so-called pulse rate hypothesis, where a society's entire population can be divided into a series of non-overlapping cohorts, each with its own unique personality. This view has been popularized by the authors William Strauss and Neil Howe. It's also been called the fourth turning theory, espoused by such luminaries as Steve Bannon to supposedly predict the future, one in which his brand of politics is due to triumph, of course. One man was dissatisfied with this sort of schema, so he came up with his own, possibly even more absurd schema. Joshua Glenn is a semiotician and author, and the publisher of the site High Lowbrow, which set out to categorize generations in even more fine-grained form. These are short 10-year periods running from, say, those born 1964 to 1973. Whether the schema makes any sense or not, what's presented on High Lowbrow allows us to at least conceptualize waves of artistic movements at least insofar as this refers to pop culture and generations. We asked Joshua why he decided to look at generations in this way. Back in 1992, when I was starting graduate school in sociology here at Boston University, a program I, I dropped out of, by the way, but while I was br briefly in the program, I, wanted, I became really interested in the idea of generationism. And Neil Howe and William Strauss's book, Generations, which was a huge bestseller, uh, in the U.S. and maybe around the world, I don't know, but it was a massive bestseller. Al Gore gave it to every member of Congress. It was a big deal. It's quoted all the time still to this day when, when journalists want to talk about generations, they reach for that book. That had come out, I think, in 91, the year before. So it was a big deal. There was a lot of discussion about it. Um, people were very interested in this kind of arcane, you know, cyclical vision of history that these two pop sociologists advanced. Neither of them were sociologists. They were public policy wonks and kind of journalists. 
and they just kind of invented, reinvented themselves as as generation experts and wrote this book. And it turned in, it became such a big hit that they then started a um, consulting business to help people market things to, to millennials and so forth. So it's all, I'm kind of cynical about their whole project, but the way they put on the generations just didn't make any sense to me. It was neither strictly calendrical, nor was it strictly kind of, um, you know, every 20 years or anything like that. It was just kind of, they cobbled it together to kind of fit this, this pre-existing idea they had about how there was a big cycle of generations and you have a, you know, you have an idealistic generation followed by a cynical generation and so forth and so on. And uh, I was vaguely aware by reading from reading zines back in those days that people slightly older than me, so I'm born in 1967. So people who were a little bit older than me who were uh, being described as boomers. So these guys said that the boomers were from 1943 to 1960. So people who I, whose zines I admired who were born in 1958, let's say, didn't feel like boomers because, you know, they had nothing to do with any of the boomer stuff. Like when Woodstock happened, you know what I mean? They were 10 years old. Um, they, that generation really felt like they came along late for the party and everybody, you know, the boomers got all this attention on them. And then these guys still got called boomers, but they weren't boomers at all. So there's a whole cohort of, I'd say, but I, I call them the, o, the OGXs, the original generation X. And they were born from 1954 to 1963, according to my, my periodization. And they were kind of um, upset and angry with their kind of older brothers and sisters or their older cousins, the boomers, for kind of taking all this space up in the culture and being saddled with that, you know, they get shoved into this generation that they really feel no connection to. Um, so their kind of generational consciousness, if you will, inspired me. And then when the media started writing about Generation X, which according to these guys, uh, how and Strauss, they called it the 13th generation, was 1961 to 1981. And you'll see a lot of different periodizations for what Generation X was, but it's around 1961 to 1981. And that didn't feel right to me either. The, that felt like there were some people in there who were from an older generation. There was me, and then there was people from a younger generation. It was just too big. So around um, 1992, when I started my zine Hermanot, um, the first several issues I, I wrote about generationism, which was something that they wouldn't let me do it in graduate school, at the sociology program. They said it wasn't really sociology. It was a fake pseudoscience. So I dropped out of that program and I was working on other things in my life. And I started publishing this zine. And one of the things I was interested in was exploring generations. But then it wasn't until I was working at the Boston Globe in 2008 that I started, kind of, kind of got interested in it again. Because I was reading, I was reading the newspaper every day because I worked at the newspaper. And I was constantly seeing references to generations. And around that time, um, Obama was claiming that he didn't feel like he was a boomer. He was, he was somebody else who was born in that kind of what I call the OGX generation the original generation Xers. And so he was, because he was so prominent, people actually listened to him for the first time. And they're like, oh, maybe there isn't a, maybe there is two generations there instead of one. So that be, I began to see like a little bit of a fissure in the, the monolithic theory of how and Strauss and the way it was being received by journalists. So what actually constitutes a generation then? So I think, first of all, that there's probably no such thing as generations. Like I kind of agree with a sociologist who, who didn't let me write about generations when I was in grad school. It is kind of an artificial construct. You know, if, if I can make one up, you can make one up. On the other hand, there are generations. There are kind of movements that happen and everybody in that movement was born within the same sort of 10 years of each other, right? Jazz and, and modernism and art and punk and alt rock, you know, the early social sciences. Everybody was born within like 10 years of each other. So I do feel like there are certainly these kind of social, what, what um, William S. Cho called um, social generations, if not kind of strictly calendrical generations. So it's kind of a necessary illusions or something. It, it, you can't really put your finger on it. It's not a science. And yet we all know that it's real. It's a thing. And uh, I guess I got interested in the idea that, um, you know, if you can't if you can't say exactly what a generation is, if you can't really get scientific about it, and I, you know, you're always going to argue with somebody else's generational scheme, then maybe the thing to do would be to be kind of absurdist about it and just decide on a very, very strict scheme that these generations run along. So that kind of what I was doing when I was at the Globe in 2008. I started just looking up, you know, the birth dates of all these people who had been in different kind of artistic and intellectual movements or musical movements, whatever it was and um, kind of thinking about the patterns that I was seeing. And what I was seeing was that it felt like a lot of 
these social generations tended to be born in a, a year that ended with the four through a year that ended with the following year that ended with a three. So these 10 year stretches from like a 1884 to a 1993 or a 1904 to a 1913. So it's a, it's a made up absurdist idea that I had and yet I kept finding evidence for it. It felt kind of true to me and I convinced myself at least that I just kind of ran with it and I just um, decided, you know, I'm going to put out my own version of this generational schema and um, see, you know, see how it works. And, you know, it, except for a few, you know, stray folks who are like a little bit older, like William S. Burroughs is a little bit older than the rest of the B generation or whatever, um, it pretty much always works. So, which either shows you that there really is no such thing as generations or that, I, or that I'm onto something. Even if Joshua Glenn accepts that there's a certain absurdism to his rigid schema, surely there's some material basis for the shift between one generation and the next. To answer one of your questions I didn't answer before, I do think there's kind of pressures, like tectonic pressures that form generations. So social change and cultural shifts and um, historical events, you know, uh, economics, demographics, how many of you are in the generation. Like the boomers were a huge generation and the culture kind of warped around them to accommodate them and give them everything that they wanted and make them happy and, you know, entertain them. And it's, it's still going on, right? As they get older, aging is changing in America. As they begin to die, dying is gonna change in America. So, you know, demographics certainly play some kind of role in it. In our next episode, we'll learn how youth, as a social and even political category, emerged in the period following the French Revolution. We'll trace how accelerating social change and historical ruptures gave birth to generational cleavages in consciousness across the 19th and early 20th centuries. Thanks for listening to OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations. This series is produced by Philip Cunliffe, George Hoare, and Alex Hochuli. Original music is by Johnny Mundy. This episode's guests have been, in order of appearance, Felix Kravatsek, Jenny Bristow, and Joshua Glenn. And the narrator is myself, Alex Hochuli. For access to all Alpha Bunga Bunga content, including bonus content, original subscriber-only episodes, and our monthly reading clubs, join us at patreon.com slash bungacast. OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations, is back with another episode next week. See you then. Absolutely not. Why not? Because you're a baby boomer and I'm a millennial. Most Gen Xers are in school during the crash. So at first they think like, so what? I am a Gen Xer. But I came to find out that actually the term Generation X, it has no meaning. How is eating meat racist? I'll gladly tell you. Looks like we've got an oppressor on our hands. The millennials and Generation Z have the Peter Pan syndrome. They don't ever want to grow up. Maybe they belong to school, you didn't do anything. While there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else. And yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. You're going to mature and you're going to realize nothing's free that things aren't equal, and that your utopian society you created in your mind and your youth simply is not sustainable. Okay, Boomer, listen up. Generational conflict is back. Boomers have stolen millennials' future. They've used up scarce resources while voting for austerity. For their part, millennials are self-absorbed avocado scoffers who rather complain than work and save. Where once the young rebels of the 1960s stuck it to the man, and by extension their parents' generation, today it's the turn of the young to challenge that very same 60s generation, now grown old, retired, and complacent. 
It's they who mortgaged our future, didn't they? This is the growing narrative of generationalism, the belief that all members of a given generation possess characteristics specific to that generation, which make it inferior or superior to another. Our turbulent times at the end of the end of history are generating new cleavages and conflicts, and the generation war is one of the most prominent across the West. Welcome to OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations, a special five-part series by Aufe Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. In part one, we bore witness to the growing discourse around generational conflict today. We set out four proposals about generations. That generations can be a useful lens through which to understand history by looking at what a generation experiences and does as it passes through life. That the emergence of generational consciousness is not automatic or predetermined, but provoked by certain traumatic, formative experiences. But that generations can be defined by more than what happens to them. They can be defined by their political agency. And finally, that generationalism is a problem. Wedging social conflicts and antagonisms into a generational frame serves to obscure class. We also learned how certain social groups within a generation come to stand for the generation as a whole. These are generation units. Think revolting students or hippies for the boomers or slackers in the case of Gen X. And finally, we learned about the role intellectuals play in giving voice to these generation units. In this episode, the historical emergence of generations in the 19th and early 20th centuries. The baby boomers, born 1945 to 64, have mythologized their own youth. In fact, youth culture seems to find its origins, even its essence, in the subcultures and counterculture of the 1960s. As the Scottish political theorist Tom Nairn wrote in a book about the 1968 revolt in France, youth could for the first time assume an other than biological meaning, a positive social meaning, as the bearer of those pressures in the social body which prefigure the new society instead of the reproduction of the old one. But what was that new society that was being prefigured? Was it truly the liberated one of the new left's dreams? For the sociologist John Clark, youth was the vanguard party, that is, the vanguard of the classless, post-Protestant consumer society to come. But long before youth became associated with either consumerism or the radical politics of the 1960s, and often both, youth was already a concern in a previous radical age in Europe, an age when youth came to prefigure the new society rather than just reproducing the old one. Io, Giuseppe Garibaldi, credente nella missione commessa da Dio all'Italia e nel dovere che ogni uomo nato italiano ha da contribuire al suo adempimento, è convinto che dove Dio ha voluto che fosse un'azione, esistano le forze necessarie per crearla, che il popolo è depositario di quelle forze, che nel dirigerle per il popolo e con il popolo sta il segreto della vittoria, do il mio nome alla giovane Italia, associazione di uomini credenti nella stessa fede, e giuro di consacrarmi in tutto per sempre a costituire con essi l'Italia, una, libera, indipendente e repubblicana. In the 19th century, ideas of youth and generational consciousness are most obviously linked with Italy. Indeed, they sort of begin in Italy and spread outwards to various other countries. Niall Wheelahan, a historian at Strathclyde University in Scotland, specializing in 19th and early 20th century history and nationalism and radicalism. E giuro, invocando sulla mia testa l'ira di Dio, l'abominio degli uomini, l'infamia dello spergiuro, se io tradissi in tutto o in parte il mio giuramento. The Italian movement begins with a man called Giuseppe Mazzini. He was an Italian Republican nationalist and he founds a movement called Young Italy in 1831. And soon after Young Italy, there is movements in other places, Young Germany, Young America, Young Poland, Young Russia, Young Ireland, Young England. So this idea of a political movement, which is qualified by age or generation in its title, Young Italy, becomes um, a phenomenon in the mid 19th century. In 1827, l'Italia non esiste ancora, ma alcuni giovani iniziano a sognarla. 
For Mazzini, this idea of youth was connected to the French Revolution and Mazzini and other radical movements throughout Europe. There was an idea that the French Revolution represented such a transformational moment or a trauma in European history that there was a difference in generations between the people born before it and after it. And in reality, what we're talking about is a difference between the old order, the ancien regime, and the new young order. So for Young Italy and Mazzini's organization in Italy, members were bought people born after the French Revolution. So that was generally people 40 years and younger. So again, ideas of age and youth are, are, are all relative here. Now we can talk a little bit more again about what age means, what it means to be young. My idea of young and old is relative to me and the people around me and so on. Participation in youthful politics or what young people got out of it depended. These were primarily democratic movements searching for more political rights, political participation. If you're a young person in 19th century Europe, you don't have a vote, your social progress is life is dependent on your parents or dependent upon other people of the older generation, you're tied to a household economy, you have no security over your labor. So a way out of that then is a participating in these young movements that give you, above anything else, agency. You don't have a political voice otherwise because you're excluded from sort of mainstream politics. So participation in these clubs that meet in cafes and bars and so on, give young people some say and some sense of agency and an idea that they can break their dependence with the older order. So what meanings were associated to being young, to youth? Now, there's people who self-identify as young, like in Young Italy and these other young movements that emerge among Europe. But the designation is also imposed by the state. And institutions label problems or, group or movements as young movements, when in reality, maybe sometimes they're not. And that can be kind of problematic, labeling something as young, because it suggests maybe a range of other things. <laughs> Well, for the state, it maybe signified a sort of hot-headedness um, along with maybe ideological danger or a threat to the established order. But, I mean, in terms of what it meant to be young, I mean, age is, is cultural and these young movements are all sort of defined by, or by culture, I guess. So to be young could be your age, whether you're under 25 or under 21. To be young could be you're not yet married. So in terms of thresholds between youth and maturity, one is age, one is marriage, one could be a job, completing an education, completing a trade, various things like that. Inheritance of property could be another one. So in the 19th century, ideas of what Jung, I guess to make the point, is just not explicitly tied to age. There are a number of other reference points. <laughs> In terms of politics, then, to be young is associated with nationalism in this period, um, nations in the making, so to speak. So like Italy, like Ireland, nations that come of age in the late 19th century or the 20th century, um, with radical politics, with reviving the promise of the revolutions of the late 18th century that maybe haven't come to pass yet, like the French Revolution, American or the Haitian Revolution, and so on. So an association with radical politics but an association that was sometimes played up by the state, that in a way by labeling a problem as a young person's problem is also somehow a means of dismissing it, of downplaying its seriousness by saying, well, these are just young hotheads. They're not necessarily serious political actors or they're not seriously engaged, if you know what I mean. Youth then came to carry a lot of social weight to have a whole range of significations. So I think the French Revolution is a major turning point and it sort of changes the ideological landscape of Europe and indeed maybe globally you can say, but it also changes this idea of young and old um, and the old order associated with sort of the bad social things, the bad things in society, and then to be young associated with the promise of the future. So it's very future tilted, you know, full of potential um, of new nations, of new societies, 
Um, it offers promise, whereas the old order is a regression to aristocracy. And I guess to be young was also very much a, a sort of rejection of, the, of aristocracy and the elites of the old world. The French Revolution was such an epochal interruption, arguably the initiation of political modernity, that it configured all subsequent politics. The French Revolution, as I mentioned before, is linked to the young Italy movement in that Mazzini sees its members as being people born after the French Revolution. So the French Revolution is such a sort of transformative event, it creates a generation. Um, in Ireland, the other country um, I work on, the maybe the defining event for generations is the Great Famine of the mid-19th century. So in mid-19th century Ireland, the population is about 8 million. And in the period of the Great Famine, which is from 1845 to 1852, that drops by about two and a half to three million people. So about three in every eight people um, are gone from Ireland, either through um, about a million people die and about a million and a half people emigrate. So there's a sense that that was such a transformative moment, it almost sets the reset button on society, so to speak. And you have people that were born before it associated with the mistakes that led to this catastrophe and the people who were born after it, who are almost like a generation zero that can create this new world and really don't owe the people, the generations of the past, anything because they made such, uh, such mistakes. And you find this case in, in, in different countries. And, uh, you'd have to turn a Protestant to get any of Nangle's soup. He came like, on a difficult mission to establish a Protestant community among a Catholic community people were dying with the hunger and he had a shipload of Indian meal with him and he built a colony down there in Dugart. I love this country, what's left of it. They went on the shore and every rock and every, every place to go was turned over with uh, looking for limpids and winkles. They had at everything. And then they started eating the seagulls, chopping it up and boiling it. And they died with dysentery and black fever and stalatine fever and yellow fever. They were dying every day. Like that. Uh, your tenants have been struggling, sir. There's already been some cases of starvation. Nonsense. Crops have failed before and mortality levels have been perfectly acceptable. Historically, we look back on that period now as just awful. I think there was some, there was some, there was some good bits and there were some less than good bits. And obviously, you know, we had a kind of a falling out. Right? There was a time when all of our land was part of our land. Does that mean, though, that what we understand as generational consciousness was already operative in the 19th century, in the shadow of the French Revolution? I suppose the first thing I would say in terms of approaching generational consciousness in Europe, um, ideas of sort of categories of generation as a category of analysis sort of come to the fore in the 1960s with Hmong sociologists in the 1970s. So it's a way or a perspective on the 19th century that's shaped by the baby boomers and by these new ideas of generation in the 1960s and 1970s that are of course associated with radicalism and, and revolution and so on. So there's a sense of these being projected back onto the 19th century, but I think there's a lot to be said for them. So you have movements like Young Italy that do self-identify as young. And, you know, a question arises then, can you take the category of generation to be similar to class or similar to ethnicity or similar to gender as being something that, you know, a, a big group of people can cohere around and express solidarity around this issue? And that's true to an extent. So in Young Italy, they do. In Young Ireland, they do. In the Fenian movement in Ireland, which my research has focused on, they do to a certain extent. But there's a difference between class as well. So in Italy, in the Young Italy movement, it's very middle class, it's university led, it's students. It's not necessarily a, 
a generational consciousness that spills into the peasantry, so to speak. You know. There is a conflict between the old order and young people and attitudes associated with the old order in terms of who can participate in politics, who are leadership figures within communities. But again, to come back to see, it's not always sort of split along age, the sort of biological age. So you get older people, let's say older in inverted commas in their 40s, maybe uh, to join in with movements of people in their 20s. Protest movements, maybe we assume them to be young. And Eric Hobsbawm, for example, has written a book, Bandits, where he associates, he uses youth as a, as a sort of an explainer all on its own. But um, I don't think it is. Uh, it mixes with other factors, such as class and, and ethnicity and, and other political factors uh, to create these uh, new movements. But on a metaphorical level, let's say, there is a conflict between the old order, which is associated with aristocracy and lack of democratic freedoms and the promise of new nations. You know, there's a sort of, in the young movements, there's a sense of individual coming of age as a participant of these movements, but also the nation coming of age in its independence, whether that's Italy or in 1870 or Ireland in, in, in the early 20th century or, or, or other nations. There's this sense of connection between the individual and the project, you know, a, a sort of young person trying to create a new young nation. The revolutions of 1789 and 1848 are obvious turning points that generate cleavages, leaving behind the Ancien Regime, birthing new nations. And then in the early 20th century, of course, the, the First World War is linked with generational cleavage and a sort of generational consciousness in the years after from, you know, 1918, maybe to the 19, into the 1920s. And the historian Robert Wall has written a famous book in 1979 about the generation of 1914. And again, this idea that the previous generation have got things so wrong, the young generation really need to take over the mantle and create this new society. You know, feeding into that is a lot of aspiration and hope for a new future, but also a lot of fantasy about, you know, what can be achieved and what young people can achieve, what's within their capacity. So war, revolution, and events like famine in the 19th century, I guess, are these sort of major transformative events that create generational cleavages and, and generational consciousness in the way that for the baby boomers in the later generations, you know, the Second World War, you could say maybe create a generational conscious, but certainly a point of reference for a sort of idea of a, of a generation and whether, you know, COVID and, you know, the age of populist politics now will connect. I mean, millennials are a, a generation that are associated with a lot of things, but it's also a, a label that's very problematic in that it combines people of a variety of ages. And ultimately, a lot of the problems maybe you associate with millennials are just social problems that don't necessarily need to be labelled with a sort of a generational label. That generation of 1914 passed through the sort of historical change that's scarcely imaginable to us today. Not history as some abstraction, but something immediate and visceral, leaving scars, physical and emotional. But even those who experienced the Great War, on the front and at home, and its far-reaching consequences as old regimes across Europe fell, could not easily be classed as a generation. As the historian Robert Vole put it in his study of the people born at the end of the 19th century, at a time when the world of reason was disintegrating into a world of irrationality, the most striking thing about the generation of 1914 seemed to be the indeterminacy of the social group to which the phrase referred. Vol decided to abandon theoretical consistency, concluding that the generation of 1914 was above all an idea. Interestingly, the most important theories about generations were themselves conceived between 1910 and 1933. It seems as if the generation of 1914 spurred on thinking about and thinking in terms of generations, much like the sociologists of the 1970s had their thinking shaped by the student revolts of the 1960s. <laughs> 
Earlier in the 19th century, generation was taken to mean relations between a father and son. But after the cataclysm of the Great War, there could be no doubt. A definite generational consciousness had emerged, grouping together youth into one social block, one that saw itself as lost. One generation passes away, and another generation comes. But the earth abides forever. The sun also rises, and the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where he arose. This is Paris of today. Our story deals with another Paris, the Paris of 1922 shortly after what used to be called the Great War. We were part of that spectacular lost generation of young people who continued to live as though they were about to die. Jake, Jake Barnes. Hello, Jake. Good to see you. How are you? Fine, fine, thanks. You look fine. You don't remember me, do you? Paris from the Ospedale Maggiore in Milano. Of course, I'm sorry. You you were with the bombardment squadron. That's it. Had ten operations, and I still can't bend my knee. You about through now? Yeah, a couple of months more, and then home. They're never going to see my face this side of the water again. Hey, what are you still doing over here? Oh, I'm working. Oh, that's right. I remember you were a newspaper man before the war. So you decided to stay here, huh? Well, that's not the way I'd play it. I'm going home, even if it is too late to be a hero. Well, uh, good luck to you, Harris. Yeah, you too. Uh, Barnes. You're all right, aren't you? Yeah, sure. A clip from the film adaptation of Ernest Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, in which a veteran of the Great War loses himself. Indeed, Gertrude Stein admonished this génération perdue. That's what you are. That's what you all are, all of you young people who served in the war. You are a lost generation. You have no respect for anything. You drink yourselves to death. Robert Vole again. This swell of generationalism reached its peak between 1928 and 1933, and then slowly ebbed, leaving its main traces in literature and memoirs. But during those years, the generational idea appeared on the pens and lips of men and women of all camps and countries. All these people were struck, as Ortega, and T.E. Lawrence were, by the discovery that one's generation was a destiny whose iron shackles permitted no escape. This realization proved useful in an age when unabashed elitism could no longer hold sway, when social revolution was knocking on the door. Generationalism would be a handy way to tangle with and engage with mass politics, but without succumbing to its logical conclusion, revolution. Robert Vole again. In an age when men of the European elite had come to understand their need for followers, the generational idea held out the tantalizing possibility of a new kind of mass formation that would be defined by age, mentality, and experience, as opposed to income, status, and interest. It posited a potential connection between privileged individuals capable of shaping attitudes and masses capable of implementing these attitudes through political action. This possibility of a new kind of political coalition explains the fascination the generational idea exerted on Europeans seeking an alternative to the determinism of class. No human system is perfect, but the system of free ports with all its faults has built up for us the greatest international trade in the world, the greatest shipping in the world, the greatest aggregation of ports in the world, the greatest expert to manufacture goods per head of the population in the whole world. We are the richest country in Europe. We pay high, the highest wages of any country in Europe except Denmark, which is also free trade. All this we are asked to fling away in a moment of bewilderment. The real aim of this election has been very cunningly concealed in the folds of the Union Jack. 
The role of intellectuals, especially literary intellectuals, was key. In most Western and Central European countries during this period, the middle classes were torn between their desire to wrest power from the former elites and their fear of a rebellion of the masses. Intellectuals from these classes dreamed of a spiritual revolution that would eliminate the exploiters and the exploited and fuse all sectors of society into a unified and conflict-free community. This generational idea appealed to them because it pointed to one way in which the spiritual revolution could be accomplished. The generation of 1914 was therefore, first of all, a self-image produced by a clearly defined group within the educated classes at a particular moment in the evolution of European society. It was both an attempt at self-description by intellectuals and a project of hegemony over other social classes that derived its credibility and its force from circumstances that were unique. Later, the particular circumstances of the 1960s, when a generation, a generation that was the product of a boom of babies after the war, when that generation encountered mass affluence in a consumer society, it would also bring much talk and singing about my generation, and much myth-making as well. What actually happened with the so-called baby boomers? Are they who they say they are? Are they who we believe them to be? The boomers, their youth and life course, their reality and myth is the subject of the next episode of OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations. Thank you for listening to OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations. This series is produced by Philip Cunliffe, George Hoare, and Alex Hochuli. Original music is by Johnny Mundy. This episode's guest has been Niall Wheelahan, and the narrator is myself, Alex Hochuli. For access to everything Alpha Bunga Bunga, including bonus content, original subscriber-only episodes, and our monthly reading clubs, join us at patreon.com slash bungacast. OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations, is back with another episode next week. See you then. Absolutely not. Why not? Because you're a baby boomer, and I'm a millennial. Most Gen Xers are in school during the crash. So at first, they think like, so what? I am a Gen Xer. But I came to find out that actually, the term Generation X, it has no meaning. How is eating meat racist? I'll gladly tell you. Looks like we've got an oppressor on our hands. The millennials and Generation Z have the Peter Pan syndrome. They don't ever want to grow up. Maybe they lost school, you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you're stealing their future in front of their very eyes. You're going to mature and you're going to realize nothing's free that things aren't equal, and that your utopian society you created in your mind and your youth simply is not sustainable. Okay, Boomer, listen up. Generational conflict is back. Boomers have stolen millennials' future. They've used up scarce resources while voting for austerity. For their part, millennials are self-absorbed avocado scoffers who rather complain than work and save. Where once the young rebels of the 1960s stuck it to the man, and by extension their parents' generation, today it's the turn of the young to challenge that very same 60s generation, now grown old, retired, and complacent. It's they who mortgaged our future, didn't they? This is the growing narrative of generationalism, the belief that all members of a given generation possess characteristics specific to that generation, which make it inferior or superior to another. 
Our turbulent times at the end of the end of history are generating new cleavages and conflicts, and the generation war is one of the most prominent across the West. Welcome to OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations, a special five-part series by Aufe Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. In this third episode of the series, we look at the baby boomers, those born 1945 to 1964, what they did when they were young and what they did as they aged, who they really are and were, and the myths they weaved about themselves. In the last episode, we learned how generational consciousness grew across the 19th century, reaching a crescendo after the First World War with the so-called lost generation. But not all generations are made the same. Some are more prominent or self-aware than others. Prominent and self-aware are terms that definitely apply to the baby boomers. The boomers have typified the cultural script in the West, as told through the sequence of decades. If you hear 1960s or 1980s, you'll have a clear idea in your head of fashion, of music, of cultural affect and political inclinations. You'll have the cliches of peace, acoustic guitar and bell bottoms, or of synthesizers, suits and stock markets. But this story is not so much a story of generational sequence, as much as what the boomers themselves did as they passed from one phase of life to another. This is partly because it's the boomers themselves who wrote that cultural script, that succession of decades each laden with a certain idea. Moreover, the period from the 1960s onwards is precisely the era when the notion of a cultural script itself becomes important and self-reflexive, that is, conscious of itself. Television, the mass medium of the age, no doubt helped. And because of an acceleration of historical change, the world did seem to change quite a bit every 10 years. But before we go any further, we need to ask some basic questions. What exactly was the baby boom? And what was this new cohort that entered the world after the Second World War? So the baby boomers are a really fascinating generation, I think. Jenny Bristow again, a sociologist at Canterbury Christ Church University and the author of a number of books on generations, including Baby Boomers and Generational Conflict, and most recently, The Corona Generation, co-written with her teenage daughter. They are called the baby boomers for two reasons. Uh, One, that they were a demographic baby boom that came just after the end of the Second World War. And I'll say a bit more about how they were defined that way in a minute. But they also were born into uh, the economic boom, the the, the post-war economic boom. Now, when you think about how that kind of idea, that that term came about, the, the baby boomer, Uh, It strikes you that it's very American. okay? so there was a baby boom after the Second World War in, you know, most parts of the Western world. But it took very different forms Um, in America. You had um, a big kind of increase in the number of children born, um, which was partly because obviously the the war had ended and soldiers were coming home and uh, partly because of the experience of uh, immigration from the Second World War and more people kind of coming to America. And that was like a sort of sustained bump that went on roughly for 20 years. In Britain, where arguably we have much less of an economic boom compared to America, the baby boom looked very different. So what you see is a real kind of spike in the births from, say, 1946 to about 1949, and then a dip. And then a bit later, you get a kind of a, a, a sort of more sustained bulge but there were you know, not that many more kids born in that period than would have normally been the case. It wasn't so kind of massive. And so the answer to the question of did the baby boom happen everywhere? Well, it sort of did, but I think it also took a very different demographic pattern. So it's fine to say it was a kind of, you know, international Western phenomenon, But we have to be careful because when claims are made about the size of the baby boom, for example, or the disproportionate size of the baby boomers to previous and subsequent generations, um, often what's what's happening there is the application of an American model onto other countries where the character of that demographic change is quite different. So if the demographic boom is clearly expressed in the US, does that also make the cultural narrative particularly American? it was different i think in america the story of the baby boomers is is a bit more kind of rounded in the sense that on the one hand you have the the story of the 
you know, the the kids who grew up in the fifties, right? And and having that sort of yeah you know, greater affluence and 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 so on. Um, and you also have the story of the counterculture and everything that kicked off around student campuses in the the late sixties. I think in continental Europe, you have a slightly different story because there wasn't that much affluence when the baby boomers were were young. But you have a powerful kind of narrative of the development of the welfare state. So these are the kids who kind of grew up with uh, the welfare state being developed to sustain their future, if you like. That, 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 that's the sort of the narrative there. So you have the welfare state as opposed to massive affluence. And of course, you had the cultural component as well, the high 60s. And you do see that in, you know, in France, Italy, Britain. But of course, just as in America, you know, university campuses aren't the whole world. You know, the, 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 where these where the counterculture happened was in quite selected places. You have that in Britain as well. I mean, I, I mean, you could even argue that the 60s in Britain, the, the idea of it is really based on a part of London in the late 60s. You know, it wasn't generalizable to the whole country, let alone the whole of university campuses. <laughs> The most salient fact about the boomers is that there are a lot of them. Helen Andrews, senior editor at the American Conservative and author of Boomers, The Men and Women Who Promised Freedom and Delivered Disaster. Which means that as they have passed through each phase of their life, they have defined America's sense of itself as they move through the life cycle. So when they were young and in their 20s, in the 1960s, America thought of itself in terms of youth. Uh, That's how we remember the 60s as a time when young people were doing young people things. And as the boomers got older, they continued to define America's sense of itself. So they were going a little bit more crazy in the 1970s. And by the 1980s, they had grown up a little, moved to the suburbs, become middle-aged. And so we think of the 80s in terms of capitalism and focusing on your careers. Uh, And by the 90s, they were parents and so on and so on. You can see it actually in our sense of the drugs that define each decade. (laughs) The 1960s were the age of marijuana because they were young and didn't have a lot of money. When they had a little bit more money in the 70s to throw around, they were buying cocaine. And in the 1980s, focusing on their careers, they were taking Valium to cope with the stress. Mm -hmm. So however old the boomers have been, they have made America revolve around them. The boomers have been characterized as the me generation, suggesting narcissism. Josh Glenn, a semiotician and author, and the publisher of the site High Lowbrow, which provides a novel periodization of generations, suggests an alternative view. When I, you know, when I was reading about narcissism and then other kinds of psychological syndromes, I came across this idea of imaginative suggestibility, which is this idea of being responsive to suggestion without hypnosis. So in other words, being able to self-hypnotize yourself. And that struck me as exactly what boomers are all about. They just completely are um, absorbed absolutely wholeheartedly, uh, 100% into whatever it is that they're into, and then also able to completely drop that, you know, move away from it again. So you get like the yippies turning into the yuppies or whatever, right? They can be 100% about this thing, and then the next day be 100% about another, another thing. There's also kind of a fantasy proneness around imaginative suggestibility where you kind of want to frame your life in a mythical register, which I think they've done on a generational scale. They're a mythical generation, but also, you know, characters from within the boomer generation are also tend to sort of self-mythologize. And there's kind of a hysteria proneness as well with imaginative suggestibility where a kind of tendency to emotional excess. I mean, all these things that I'm talking about make make you think of the anti-war movement, the environmental movement, women's movement, anti-nukes, all the stuff around, um, you know, Jaws and E.T. and all these big blockbuster movies, um, movies about coming of age in that era, like Grease and American Graffiti and Animal House. And of course, all these movies about coming of age in the 60s, like, you know, Good Morning Vietnam and Hairspray and Platoon and Born on the Fourth of July. And then kind of being prone to hysteria around whether it's Beatlemania or Woodstock or Altamont. What then were the formative events that could lead to this construction of character, at least among a certain generation unit, that is, a section of a cohort that comes to represent the generation as a whole? 
Jeffrey Alexander, professor of sociology at Yale University, and one of those student rebels back in the 1960s. I wanted to become a lawyer and, uh, and then a politician in Los Angeles to help restructure the United States. So it was a pretty traditional you know, arc of what I was going to do. And then when I went to Harvard, I went, when I was 18, I was going to um, realize that idea. But then, and the first year of Harvard was more or less without generational disruption. Around the, the middle of 1966, everything seemed to explode. Uh, it was just like a, a break in time almost. And for the next four or five years, there was this kind of opening in history that seemed to be create a liminal experience of intense. I was intensely aware of a break with everything that the society represented with my parents um, who I had always had a lot of affection and respect for. And the first experience of that was in terms of, you could say sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It wasn't very political except in an indirect sense. It was, it was about trying to experience a different life that was, you know, a kind of fused romantic experience. But a company that is alienation from the institutions like Harvard, which I had an intense reaction against at that time. And this division of the world between straight, what was called the straight world, the establishment and the world that we felt we were part of. And there was this feeling of great solidarity, different way of dressing, a uh, different way of looking, different way of acting, uh, different ways of greeting people. In the midst of this, I became hyper aware of, I mean, my big issue, I think, was the Vietnam War. And as I became radicalized, I became politicized by virtue of the war, not really by virtue of race. That wasn't my personal experience. But then I decided, which was true, that the United States was just completely criminal in its behavior in Vietnam and that the leadership of the United States were very deceptive and misleading. And I joined demonstrations. We thought that they had led completely corrupt lives. That notion of don't trust anybody over 30, it seemed, it's laughable now, but then it seemed palpable and completely real. So my father was in advertising and I thought, even though I still had personal affection for my father, I thought he had corrupted, sold out, that he was doing the worst, worst, worst possible thing with his life. I hated capitalism. And I also thought that the social work, and I gradually came to feel that my mother's life of amelioration and helping oppressed people was only a revolution, that she was misled. Well, what happened at the end of college is I really focused a lot on the war. I felt the United States was imperialistic and I joined SDS became very involved politically in the campus struggles. I was uh, suspended for a sit-in that disrupted a faculty meeting that was considering this thing called ROTC, which was the military training program of Harvard students in return for having them get a scholarship to the whole time. And then they become officers. So, I mean, these were very, in a way, terrifying experiences, uh, at least for me, because you were confronting authority very harshly. And then SDS was organized into two factions and the factions fought each other. And eventually there was a takeover of the administration building at Harvard and then there was a giant explosion and I was elected to the steering committee of the Harvard student strike at a meeting. There were about 1,200 or 2,000 people. And that was really the peak experience. It seemed like the world had opened up. It was like a, 
Wordsworthian or Blake. It was this apparent inversion of the rationalism and the what I felt at the time, the deep, the impersonalism, uh, the alienation. So the entire spring semester of Harvard was stopped. People were, were tie-dyeing and selling crafts in the center of the Harvard yard. And we were going to meetings every day to try to theorize the overthrow of capitalism. So it was kind of like the French commune experience. I mean, it was, it was really, um, it was beautiful. I mean, we were beside ourselves as were thousands of other young men and women at the time. In Germany, naturally, the social landscape after the war was different. Holger Nering, historian of Europe at the University of Stirling in Scotland, and an expert in the transnational history of social movements. To start with, it was first of all a world of complete destruction. So, so the German cityscape, especially if you grew up in a city, would have still shown the scars of the destruction of the uh, Second World War well into the late 1950s, if not even uh, longer than that. So this really framed some of the, of the background to that. And in connection with that, especially for those who then got involved in social movements, there was also a feeling of moral destruction and also uh, guilt, or at least vicarious guilt. So these two experiences, quite interesting how they interacted in different groups of the population, because you then have on, on one level, you have a sort of emerging hedonistic subculture that are then classified as the so-called Halbstarke or, or the sort of hooligans who basically got into with growing affluence into consumer culture. So they bought themselves uh, motorbikes or mopeds and uh, they consumed um, mostly American but then also increasingly uh, British pop music or, or rock music, which if you listen to this today, uh, sounds very tame, but really caused huge, uh, huge scandals. You know, why are they doing this? Why are they wasting their times like this? They're not good citizens. So you have kind of that strand. You then have another strand of a group of people, usually probably uh, slightly older, mostly actually the parents who would um, engage in uh, consumption um, and essentially lead private lives. So a huge emphasis on the family uh, and privacy uh, within affluence. And this was probably the largest chunk of the population. And then you have this is usually on the political left, but not only, and that's quite interesting, um, a group of people who actually say neither of those approaches actually works. Um, we need to get actively uh, politically involved and actually overcome this kind of sense of both physical and moral destruction somehow. And we shouldn't be lured into um, the, uh, the kind of consumer uh, culture and we shouldn't be lulled by it. So uh, consumption perhaps, yes, but not in the sense of um, getting uh, dominated by it. Did this mean a direct generational confrontation, even within the family unit? On one level, yes, especially if you look at uh, the kind of uh, student movements of the 1960s. This is very strongly there in the rhetoric, this kind of accusation of uh, parents of having been complicit precisely because of this kind of inward-looking, consumer-oriented, private, bourgeois, sometimes educated bourgeois, so what was called a spiesig uh, lifestyle at the time, so sort of philistine, if one were to translate spiesig mindset. Um, but the interesting thing is, so did Les Siegfried, for example, has shown this in, in his great work, that within families, actually, this didn't matter that much. So, so there weren't sort of constant discussions at the dinner table. So, so the students, some of the students who still live with their parents or would come home uh, to their parents over weekends or, or over, over the holidays, they would not necessarily seek confrontation with their parents at home. Uh, they would do this in, in public. So there was a kind of interesting disjuncture from that perspective as well. You want to protest the war. Protest it right here in Old Room Rock. What am I going to do, march around the post office? 
Bring the war home, isn't that the slogan? Look, they gave me this award. It's just a stupid plaque, but it means one thing. If you take a stand, people notice. If you oppose the war, right here, with all your strength, this is part of America too, you know. Read Marx. Revolutions don't begin in the countryside. We're not talking about revolution. You're not talking about revolution. Police have widened their search for the missing teenager, Meredith Laval, for her involvement in the bombing of a post office. Philip Roth certainly captured something in his depiction of the 1960s and the collapse of old authority in American Pastoral, the film adaptation from which the preceding clip was taken. However, Jenny Bristow agrees with Holger Nehring's findings that revolt did not so much happen in the home against one's parents. So what were the boomers reacting against? I don't think they were reacting against their parents. I think that's one thing, not necessarily. So I think there was a sense that they were the kind of lucky generation. You know, their parents had been the ones who'd been embroiled in the war and, and, and so on and so forth. And I think that element of it is often missed by the fact that people often pick up on the fact that the counterculture and the student radicals you know, had this slogan, never trust anyone over 30, you know, that it's it's looked at through present day eyes as being these baby boomers reacting against their parents. I don't think that they were doing that. I think what they were doing was reacting against the collapse of the norms and values that had sort of sustained society through the 20th century and just about managed, you know, through the Second World War and going through to the other side. So what you actually had was this younger generation just reacting against the the, the fragmentation of uh, the old way of doing things and coming along and um, really taking to its own heart, if you like, that, that sense of the need for youth, the need for novelty, the need for things to be different. So that's why in Britain... When you see the uh, late 1960s, you have you, know, you have abortion being legalised, you have homosexuality being decriminalised, you have the age of majority being lowered, you have the almost self-conscious kind of emergence of a much more what was called permissive society at that time, because the old ways of doing things no longer worked. And I think it was that young people were kind of at the head of that, that process of arguing for change. But of course, they weren't the ones passing legislation. Exactly. So, you know, it wasn't them that did it. <laughs> they didn't kind of necessarily make that change. And and when I've looked at the discussion about the baby boomers in the academic literature, so there's a, a lot of it published in the early 70s. And what's really interesting there is that the people writing about the, the counterculture and the radicals and the need for change are academics who are older. You know, they're they're trying to change things from within the academy, you know, and they're kind of reflecting on what, what the kids are doing. But it's a product of arguments that are going on within higher education at the time, rather than just, you know, what some young students happen to be doing. As the American critic and essayist Louis Menand, born 1952, argues, there are many canards about the boomer generation, but the most persistent is that the boomers were central to the social and cultural events of the 1960s. Apart from being alive, baby boomers had almost nothing to do with the 1960s. Or is it that the older boomers, say someone born in 1945, who would have been 23 in 1968, did play a part in the 1960s, but that the problem is otherwise, that the boomers may not be such a coherent generational category? This is as Josh Glenn argued back in part one. So I'm born in 1967. So people who were a little bit older than me, who were uh, being described as boomers, so people who I, whose zines I admired who were born in 1958, let's say, didn't feel like boomers because, you know, they had nothing to do with any of the boomer stuff. Like when Woodstock happened, you know what I mean? They were 10 years old. Um, they, that generation really felt like they came along late for the party. You know, the boomers got all this attention on them. And then these guys still got called boomers, but they weren't boomers at all. So there's a whole cohort of, I'd say, but I, I call them the OGXs, the original generation X. And they were born from 1954 to 1963. And they were kind of um, upset and angry with their kind of older brothers and sisters or their older cousins, the boomers, for kind of taking all this space up in the culture and being saddled with that, you know, they get shoved into this generation that they really feel no connection to. 
But the problem of the boomers isn't just that those who did the 1960s weren't always boomers, but that the 1960s, especially 1968, have been mythologized and misremembered. Well, you know, my book was really less about what 68 was than the way it has been remembered or trivialized or banalized. Kristen Ross, professor emeritus of comparative literature at New York University and a specialist in French culture. In her book, May 68 and Its Afterlives, Ross examines the way those events have been so mythologized. I wrote it in the late 90s, and, um, and at that time, something like... Uh, the backdrop of the war in Algeria or the um, movements of decolonization in Africa, French colonies, but not only the French colonies, none of that was uh, visible as what I felt it to be the particular history and political memory of the people who were out on the streets. Algeria was the background noise of their childhood. They, uh, and, and there had been enormous labor unrest in France throughout the early 1960s as well. So both of these things uh, became, especially Algeria became a, a catalyst for French people to become conscious of what they opposed in their own society. So it was extremely important, even though uh, by, by, you know, the late 1980s, it had disappeared from the map of what people could actually talk about or think about when it came to 68. It was no longer, you know, 68 by the 1980s had become nothing really but a, a kind of sexual revolution. For all that the 60s involve a lot of forgetting, Jeffrey Alexander remembers a totalizing sort of revolt. There was a feeling, a broad feeling that society was, I suppose, what you'd say a Foucauldian idea or a Frankfurt School idea that it was totally against humanity. For me, I wasn't a Marxist yet, really. I mean, I was reading New Left Marxism. So we were against capitalism, absolutely. Uh, the buying and selling, the commodification, we were against bureaucracy, the Harvard bureaucracy. Uh, and we felt that the war machine was dominant, this insidious war-making instrument. We were just sickened every day by what was happening in Vietnam. We felt it very personally. It was, it was horrifying. And so we hated our government. And we, we talked about complicity. We felt that Harvard was complicitous, which it was in many different ways with the war. I don't think it was probably good, looking back on it, to make Harvard the enemy instead of, uh, you know, the Pentagon or the U.S. government, although we knew they were the enemy. We didn't have a clear sense of political space. So this is what we did. You know, like Freud said in Civilization and its Discontents, I mean, modern society, or may maybe all society, you know, requires a tremendous level of self-control and repression. And every once in a while, there's these explosions of social um, need, psychological social experience that defies, is like a, a scream of protest, a sigh of pleasure. Most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, these needs are met as individuals uh, through sex, through aesthetic experiences, through reading novels and, or eating or drinking, you know, or through small groups of friends. But then once in a while, it kind of becomes societalized and is a massive experience. And I think there are periods in Western history and others, I mean, sometimes it's really evil, like in the Cultural Revolution in China, I, I imagine they have the same kind of experiences as we did of, of this kind of society breaking up and you feel this massive communal experience with millions of people like you and you feel like a utopia is being created where we won't have to work, we won't have to discipline or repress, we could create a new world. 68 is the symbol the number that symbolizes this experience 
throughout the Western world. I, I would I would characterize it like that. I, I think that sociologists are, and, and I mean social scientists, even Marxist theorists, critical theorists are not, when they think of modernity, they usually think of it as simply a line of rationalization. But really, it's not like that. I mean, starting in the 1800 and then the early 1800s, the birth of Romanticism then becomes part of, in a way, a dialectic, an attention inside. So it's not just that we live in this super rationalized society, which it is, but it's also that there's this romantic strain of feeling and thinking and art and many things. I mean, love, love is a big part of the life of everybody in this society. So yeah, I think that that was an intensely romantic upheaval. The story in Germany bears a certain resemblance, but with a different emphasis. Holgernering again. So, so the first movement that probably really captured a younger generation was the movement uh, against uh, nuclear weapons for the West German army. So, so the, the movement against nuclear disarmament. There have been uh, movements against conscription and against uh, West German rearmament, as it was called, uh, before that. Uh, conscription was obviously an issue that was very live uh, for younger people because they didn't want to be uh, conscripted. Uh, but the first movement that really appealed to the younger generation on a broader scale was the protests against uh, nuclear weapons. And that was first something that was organized by the trade unions and the uh, social democratic party. So it basically started actually as, as, a, as a party, as an organized initiative. Um, but then increasingly became an independent uh, movement, uh, especially because then the party uh, abandoned that as part of its uh, reformist turn. And so uh, this, was, this then saw the emergence of the Easter marches. What's interesting about this is that there you can actually see this constellation that I talked about before, uh, namely a deep skepticism towards uh, the West German state. Uh, on, on the one hand, as, as, a, as an entity, and this goes back to the theme of destruction, physical destruction, that could basically mete out violence and, and death uh, to populations. The skepticism is really surprising if you look at opinion polls. You have, this is not just in the young uh, population, but especially pronounced in the young population, 80% basically do not trust the state with the military. It's, it's a staggering so there's kind of implicit support for this in, in the majority of the population. Um, but then on the other hand, um, also a deep skepticism towards um, this kind of uh, turn uh, to the family, uh, to privacy. You can see this very well, how the first Easter marches actually uh, campaigned, because they say we are engaged citizens. So we need to, we, we cannot just sleep they made an explicit and very problematic uh, comparison with, with Nazi Germany by saying this is a similar constellation, you know, where have you been? Um, if our children ask us, we, we cannot stand silent again. And this was very important, this kind of idea of active uh, citizenship uh, that campaigned against the state for a very individualistic notion of political involvement that was free from uh, party political or organized politics. Did the usual U.S.-derived cliches about the 60s, about spiritual revolution, apply in West Germany? This was a very prominent strand, uh, but I would probably not call it uh, the main strand. So this was something that was that, that clearly mattered a lot, mattered especially, uh, for example, in, in Berlin and also in Frankfurt. Um, so it's, it's very localized in a way. Um, where, where you also had sort of communes who try to kind of live that hedonistic lifestyle. Um, but um, more generally, it was actually a rather pluralistic theme, and there, there were different routes through the 60s. There were different routes, for example, for those on the Easter marches who, who loved listening to skiffle uh, music, to folk music, also uh, German folk music. Uh, which which was modeled on you know Pete Seeger etc um, and and others 
that kind of uh, stream, which was, of course, also to a certain extent uh, hedonistic, but in a different way from, uh, say, the, the communes. This was more like a sort of classical uh, youth movement uh, that want to explore also the countryside, etc. So um, very often also organizationally within uh, Friends of Nature. And what's also forgotten and what the most recent research has actually highlighted is that um, the 1960s were also relevant for the uh, for political conservatism because this is when a new generation of uh, conservatives actually got politicized and conservatives who, who were to become uh, very important in the politics of Christian democracy in the 1980s. And so uh, they were politicized because they re reacted against the arguments made by, uh, by the kind of new left, by the, by the political left. And in a sense, they were in a, in a so there was in a sense a, an intra-generational uh, split uh, that we can see, which is only now coming into view. And they were, of course, uh, less um, happy to engage with uh, sort of hippies, with folk music, uh, with communal living, uh, but they would essentially take a sort of an ideal of citizenship that was far more restrained, presented itself as extremely rational and basically uh, condemned uh, protests uh, you know, riotous or rowdy protests on the street. Although, of course, the interesting thing is that they themselves did that by, by staging protests or by provoking protests. The French 1968 was, of course, one of the most important. Beyond the mythology, what was it actually about? Kristen Ross. May 68 was the largest mass movement of modern French history, and it was also the most significant labor uh, movement. Uh, it was a general strike. It, um, it was a movement that extended throughout France to every town, every professional sector, shipbuilders, you know, grocery clerks, uh, every age group, every region of the country. And when you, you know, when you are able to, to think about it and perceive it that way, then you see very clearly the way in which the memory of uh, 68 got sort of hijacked by a number of so-called student leaders who transformed themselves into um, official memory custodians. And they were the ones that the media went to every time a commemoration uh, of, of the event took place. And the same people were interviewed year after year after year. And it was my frustration with that kind of reductionism that made me want to write the book. The whole uh, attempt to unite the uh, opposition to the reigning ideology, the political ideology in the country with uh, workers' movement is what makes France and Italy pretty special because they, you know, for example, if you look at the UK or the US or even Germany, the counterculture was far more important than it was in France. Uh, you could, in the UK, you could become politicized by coming through the back door of the drug scene or the music scene or, or, or um, aspects like that. Whereas in France, those kind of countercultural elements came much later, they were far less significant and they, they generally represented something more like the waning of political militancy rather than a way to, uh, for a young person to become politicized. There's been a tendency to, I think, to kind of Americanize the memory of French May. And that has to do with precisely emphasizing certain kinds of countercultural elements. So who were the protagonists of May 68 in France? 
Well, by the time I was writing my book, the the uh, the cast of characters had gotten reduced to really just a very, very few people. They were all Parisian. They were all students and they were all, you know, uh, located in a couple of university settings. Um, and at the time when I was uh, doing my research, I made a, a kind of a prediction that at some point, one of these, you know, leaders like Daniel Cohn Bendit, who is, of course, you know, became the sort of icon of French May, that we would begin to realize that what he was about, or himself as a figure of '68, we would we would recognize that he was, in fact, far less important than, say, Bernard Lambert, who was a, a radical farmer in Nantes. And that, in fact, what occurred in Nantes in 1968, where they actually established an alternative city government made up of a commune with the farmers producing the food, the, the, the workers on strike, and the students, you know, a three-way, I mean, three different social agents working together to, to take care of their daily life that this was far more important, actually, something like that, a kind of reawakening of the commune form was uh, far more significant than than what was occurring in the streets of Paris. Uh, And I say that especially now, because if you look at uh, a a very significant social movement, contemporary one in France, like the Zad at Notre Dame des Londres, where once again, it's it's working with the the tradition of, of radicalized agriculture, which you have in the in the southwest and the northwest in in France, in Brittany, and Normandy. That these um, you know that tradition, which fed into what happened for them and what they did in '68, has actually you know produced something that you know there are continuities now with with the movements to uh, that are primarily ecological, you know, now to, and having to do with, you know, food production, radical agriculture. Um, I find this to be far more significant than anything that got encompassed under the name of the student movement. Young workers who were out on the street and out on strike were constantly described in the media as the students. <laughs> so you, you did have young workers, of course, and the young workers tended to be more radical than the older. Not always, but, you know, because certainly older workers were out on strike as well and were, um, you know, the, their history, as I mentioned, goes back to, you know, mining strikes and uh, shipbuilder strikes in the early 60s. Or even if you think about the peace movement, something like the fact that, to my mind, the one element that unites 60s radicalism globally is one word, Vietnam. And in any country where you go go and look at the early peace movement and how that developed into a, such a major thing in the in 68 that was completely intergenerational you know you had a lot of uh, older people you had a, a big mix of people who were concerned primarily with american imperialism and the war in vietnam I mean, there was an enormous anxiety that was generated. There was a panic in the elite when you have anonymous people out in the streets, you know, seizing the streets. It generates a lot of anxiety. And when when that happens, people leap towards these cliches and these kinds of ideas like youth rebelling. Well, it doesn't explain very much why then not, you know, why not now? Why, you know, it doesn't say anything really. Prise d'assaut par les CRS, les barricades brûlent. Derrière chacune d'elles, les étudiants résistent avec tout l'acharnement de leur jeunesse et de leur conviction. C'est une véritable bataille qui va durer quatre heures. Les grenades lacrymogènes dont on parlera longtemps explosent. Et tout au long de la nuit, les secours aux blessés poseront un grave problème. 
So the reality of the 1960s revolt has been misunderstood in many dimensions. Its participants, as we've seen, weren't all part of the baby boom generation themselves. Nor were all boomers involved in the protest movements. Moreover, the radical movements of the age weren't all rebelling in the name of youth per se. Today's cultural narrative increasingly blames the boomers for their recklessness, tying 1968 to a whole raft of social transformations that came after, from rampant consumerism to environmentalism, and from a satiated conservatism to what is today called woke. But rather than opt for the easy, facile course of blaming the boomers for things that exist today that we don't like, according to whatever our prejudices may be, let's look in more detail at what the consequences of 1968 actually were, and what the radical boomers went on to be. First, in Germany. So you have, of course, some kind of case studies in, in the form of uh, very famous uh, 68ers who then had political careers such as uh, Joschka Fischer, former German foreign minister, but then also uh, Hans Walter Schilly, uh, who was the interior minister, then both in the Schröder government in the 1990s. Holger Nering again. And the transformation is actually is, is quite staggering. Uh, already if you actually look at the style of dress. Um, so um, Fischer in the 1980s still insisted of going into the plenary of the Hessen uh, parliament uh, with his sneakers and his jeans. And he then turned up in the 1990s uh, with a three-piece suit. And in a sense, Chile is, is the same thing. And Chile was actually one of the most hardcore home secretaries you could get. Whereas in um, the uh, in the 1970s, he uh, defended left-wing terrorists against the German state. And in a sense, what unites this is actually is this concern with, with the German state, with, with uh, individual activism. And to some extent, actually, at the core, they remained uh, true to themselves in that sense. But of course, um, the, the uh, surrounding uh, environment changed. And the influence, especially of 1968, on the emergence of uh, feminism in, in West Germany as a, as a political movement and also in the way in which it got embedded into especially social democratic policies, but then also uh, green policies, the emergence of the Green Party and of environmentalism uh, cannot really be understood uh, without reference to 1968 and the kind of fundamental uh, liberalization and politicization of uh, society at that time. There was, of course, a backlash in the 1970s, but what's really remarkable if uh, you think about it is that now uh, we are talking about Christian Democratic Green uh, Coalition. And if you had told anyone in the, uh, when the Green Party was founded in the late 70s, early 80s, that this would happen, people would have uh, basically laughed you off the field. They would have said, you know, this is, you know, it's going to happen in a million years. It's never going to happen because the socio-cultural differences, uh, ideological differences were just too vast. Was this growing social liberalism that then became institutionalized a victory for social movements or their defeat? Was the kernel of a later neoliberalism always present in those movements? I would probably tend towards the latter idea. So the one that this was uh, already present uh, around um, in, in the 60s, because there is quite a structural similarity between uh, the sort of grassroots organizing, uh, bottom-up protests, hedonism um, of some of the ideologies around 68 uh, that then turns into a kind of neoliberal uh, dogma of, of self-improvement later on, especially from the 1990s onwards. So there is a sort of uh, structural similarity between them. Um, the interesting thing is, though, that it's not quite as simple because, of course, in, in uh, 68, there was a whole ideology and whole different practices circulated around that that tied this into broadly left-wing and socialist and socially critical ideas. And that's, in a sense, the difference. And something happens at some point for some people in the meantime uh, that, that gets rid of those socially critical uh, ideas. So Christian Ross has argued this for France, and I think we can see this partly also uh, for West Germany. It has to do with the emergence of the constant of generation in interpreting uh, 1968. 
uh, because that takes some of the radicalism out of it and turns this into a sort of community, a moral uh, movement, and uh, but but no longer into a political movement that was actually fighting for uh, political ideas and for political representation of issues that had so far been neglected. And so this is kind of one strand. And then the other thing to notice is that there's a huge diversity of different approaches. So, so you do have um, some people, some 68 are still around who are actually still living in, in the kind of communal lifestyle that they championed um, in uh, the, the 1960s, clearly a minority. There are others who became sort of prof professional protesters and protest organizers um, or who got involved in some sort of subcultural or countercultural uh, publishing or organizing. Um, they, many of them have, have died in the meantime, but uh, some of them are still around. But then there are also some who re receive pretty um, good positions now as professors, many of them retired, uh, but they are likely to be the most critical um, of uh, the kind of turn towards con consumer capitalism. Um, so there's just been a new, uh, it's a sort of experimental uh, novel that's come out by Heinz Bude and two others who were involved in squatting in West Berlin in the 1980s and who came out of the 68 movement. And they are now looking around saying it's all going downhill because there's no one who believes in this anymore. And so this is, this is kind of, it's very interesting uh, because you have basically all these different positions there. So there's no, ne no sort of generational necessity in it. And that goes to the core, of course, of the concept of generation because you do need to have something that ties it together. Mm -hmm. And that's, that has gone. So you could say the boomers really cast a shadow on subsequent generations. Yes, and also, some, on, and also previous generations because, for example, Dirk Moses has made the important point that uh, to some extent the 45ers, so the generation that was born in the 1920s was actually much more foundational to what happened in the Federal Republic than uh, the 68ers. Um, of course, you can then kind of have a competition between generations, but in a sense, 68 was probably the last generational moment in, in West Germany. Although I think uh, 1989 was certainly uh, extremely important for, uh, for East Germans, uh, obviously, as a unifying moment. But I think for West Germans, 1989, depending on what, where you lived, so if you lived, for example, in Southwest Germany, uh, if you uh, did not have any personal relationships, family connections to East Germany, 1989, 90 might have been a sort of monumental world historical event, but not a, a generationally uh, defining issue. We'll return to the experience of that 1989 generation, Generation X, or the end of history generation, in part four of this series. For now, though, it's worth asking what happened when West Germans who had experienced the Western 68 encountered those from the East who had not. They did have a radically different experience of the 1960s in the sense that uh, they lived in a dictatorship at the time. So everything they did by way of consumption, by way of organizing, independent of what uh, the party state wanted them to do, was automatically politicized. So uh, whereas in Germany, we could see a sort of relaxation of that kind of policing of behavior, also private behavior, consumer behavior, uh, in the GDR, this remained intact. So they had to devise ways and means uh, around that and had to find sort of uh, little niches. So historians have uh, spoke, uh, spoken about here the, the niche society of the GDR, uh, where they could basically practice these kinds of things. And in, indeed, they did. Uh, but they did this in, in very different ways. Um, and uh, they, they therefore had very different uh, experiences, very different cultural reference points 
uh, and so on and so forth. And in fact, contacts did exist. Uh, there was also a very small East Berlin 1968. There's been some research on this now, but they didn't understand each other very well, precisely because of this uh, different issue of uh, to do with, uh, with the completely different political regimes. Ultimately, what made the 68 generation in Germany? And what distinguished it from the UK, the US, or indeed France? The, the focus on grassroots organizing in combination with a very deep skepticism of organized party politics. I think this is probably, uh, if we are looking at the political left, this is probably one of the most important things uh, which we cannot see in, in other countries. Because what's really remarkable is that none of the 68ers in, in West Germany, not, not the big names, but also not on a small scale, they weren't just reintegrated into social democracy or into some then uh, moved back into, into the sort of communist milieu. There was then again a sort of attempt at building a communist party uh, in West Germany. Uh, but many ended up in sort of little grouplets, you know, socialist, Maoist, um, some of them concerned with human rights, uh, some of them then specifically with the women's movement. And um, they were basically, in a sense, uh, lost for party politics at that moment. And it's then the Green Party that creates that space again because they, they create themselves on a different level where organizations don't matter that much. And I think we can't see this uh, to that extent in France or in Italy and certainly not in, in the United States. And um, that kind of makes West Germany, I mean, it's always difficult to talk about uniqueness, but I think this is pretty unique because in, in Britain, for example, 68ers would just continue to get engaged within, uh, say, the, the Labour Party or the, the Communist Party. And, and that was fine. Whereas, in a sense, the, the really striking thing is that, to some extent, uh, Willy Brandt, when, when he was the Chancellor, said we need to dare more democracy, is his attempt to bring uh, these groups back into social democratic politics, which is where many of them had originally come from, that attempt actually fails. And the experiences around 1968 had a lot to do with it because it was partly a social democratic state that then crushed their attempts to find their individual self-fulfillment. Meanwhile, in France... It's also not only youth revolting, but also uh, the development of an entire genre uh, that I found almost comical in its ubiquity. Kristen Ross again. As the certain student leaders entered into the careers of their choice, which had largely had to do with the media, they were very much oriented towards, you know, publishing, towards journalism, towards establishing themselves. And as they did so, they there was a kind of a rite of passage whereby they would then apologize for their former radicalism and at the same time use that radicalism as a kind of a ticket towards uh, a certain kind of publicity while they were denying it. It's at that point that the trope of generation as a kind of marketing concept, first and foremost, but also as a way to avoid looking like they were the turncoats that they were, they generalized their own experiences into a, you know, a, a larger category, you know, the worldwide generation of, of naive, uh, we were naive, we were idealistic, and, and we made our mistakes, but now we've spun our errors into gold. And they literally did spin their <laughs> uh, errors into gold in a lot of cases. I mean, they had very nice careers. Voilà, ben nous les jeunes, nous les blousons noirs, qu'est-ce qu'on dit Ben on dit fuck le système. Sauf que quand t'es pote avec le président, ben tu peux plus trop le fucker le système. La révolution sexuelle, c'est super. Je viens d'ailleurs d'honorer douze Suédoises à la Sorbonne. So was 68 always the founding of a new capitalist spirit, or was its real meaning traduced? Those two stories that you've just uh, encapsulated are 
are the version of, of 68 that appeared in really that was constructed very carefully in time for the 20th anniversary in the, in the late 80s. In the late 80s, now you've got to remember this is this is the this is the 1980s. So they had to create a version of 68 that looked that way. And in effect, by 1988, 68 had become its own opposite. There was a there was a neoliberal 68 that was the dominant uh, view, and it still is very much with us. You know, I was invited to um, the uh, Elysee Palace in 2018, and Macron he wrote to me and he said, "What well, they were they said they wanted to celebrate 68 throughout the entire year." So I wrote back and I said, what precisely do you want to celebrate? And he said, well, we want to celebrate the end of illusion. <laughs> and he, and, and what else? He, we wanted the, you know, the, we wanted to celebrate the modernization of France, the end of illusion, the end of utopia. And he went through one by one, all of the various cliches that uh, I had written about in my book. And I, I wrote back and I said, well, in that case, you don't need me. I mean, just read my book. <laughs> and you've just recapitulated the official version of 68 that was, that was really came into being in the 1980s. And um, I received the most violent, uh, I have to say that I received a very violent response, in a, you know, saying I would never be invited again. <laughs> And that they, had, that they had made a mistake inviting me in the first place. And so he decided instead to commemorate the end of World War I, which he thought was a very safe topic. So he went out to these small towns in northern France where he was met by the Gilets Jaunes. So it didn't really work out. Kristen Ross has written that the official version of 68 tells the story of family or generational drama stripped of overt political dimensions, a transformation of lifestyles that modernized France, changing it from an authoritarian bourgeois state to a new liberal modern financier bourgeoisie. How was this narrative constructed? For one thing, to you know, reify the, the actors into something called students, precisely at the time when students were refusing to study or to think in terms of student interests, you know, what, 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 the, what the students in, who participated in 68 in France were doing is posing a, a far more general kind of crisis than, you know, their own interests, particular interests at the university or, you know. So I saw what was happening as a real crisis in in functionalism. You know, students stopped studying, workers stopped working, everyone stopped doing what they were supposed to be doing. There was a specific pleasure, I think, of those weeks and, and months had to do with a kind of overcoming of social segregation that was so enormous and uh, strong in France, you know, I mean, I always go back to Henri Lefebvre claimed that 68 happened in, in France because Nanterre students, when they got off the subway, they had to walk through these Algerian slums to get to class. And simply that kind of, of um, meeting of two worlds uh, where then you had those students going back and uh, with those Algerian workers talking to them about the Vietnam War, you know. Uh, so meetings of that kind that took place that, that represented sort of disjunctions between one's political subjectivity and one's social group so that you had a, a, a real kind of a mixing that had never happened in that way. Um, so I'm trying to describe really a relational subjectivity that was was what 68 was about between social groups that had been very segregated. And 
And that had everything to do with, you know, again, not assuming uh, a certain kind of expertise about who who spoke for whom or who, you know, who who had the uh, the ability to characterize what was going on. As the proceeding attests to, there is a debate today as to whether that which followed on from the 1960s say the yuppies of the 1980s or the humanitarian wars of the 1990s and 2000s, or wokeness today, was actually the development of the inner logic of the 60s, or not. Some hold that it wasn't, that the ensuing new spirit of capitalism, otherwise called neoliberalism, or maybe the Californian ideology, basically your boss not wearing a tie, your workplace having a wellness center, and your personal life being increasingly driven by notions of productivity, that that had nothing to do with the 1960s. This side in the debate holds that the ensuing Californian ideology, that is, capitalist rationalization combined with countercultural ethics, was a total travesty of what was demanded on the streets back then. The hippies aren't responsible for neoliberalism. Others hold the opposite view, that the 1960s revolt was always necessarily going to lead to postmodernism, narcissism, hypercommodification, and so on. The hippies were just yuppies and wokes avant la lettre. Maybe, but to answer the question, it's better to set out the terms more clearly. If the 1960s was all about a change in values, a reflection of a new generational consciousness, without any structural transformation or change in the balance of class forces in favor of labor, then of course it would lead to nothing more than a renovation of capitalism. Of course capital would recuperate these values for its own purposes, abandoning patriarchy, tradition and order, in favor of equality, individualism and flexibility. However, that may not be all that the 1960s were about. Indeed, there were other important things going on around the world. Mass strikes, anti-colonial movements, revolutionary politics. These were undoubtedly defeated, while the rebels in favor of a new ethos won. And history is written by the victors. So what has come to stand for the 1960s in popular memory is middle-class students in Paris mounting the barricades in the name of Eros, or middle-class students at Ivy League smoking pot. Not to mention the way the 1960s radicals degenerated in the following decade. Dress up! I will that we uns Hey, was das für eine scheiß repressive Truppe hier? Sexuelle Befragung und anti-imperialistischer Kampf gehören zusammen, verstehst du? Ich kann den auch gar nicht verstehen, baby. <laughs> Ficken und Schießen sind ein Ding! <laughs> Fucking and shooting are the same. It's worth recalling that this is a debate that exists beyond Western Europe and North America. The Brazilian literary theorist Roberto Schwartz, born 1938, wrote on the de-radicalization of the 60s generation. The major socio-political successes of the resistance generation had its price. As it occupied new positions, it shed its earlier convictions, either due to realism, believing those earlier convictions to be obsolete and that they did not apply to the new moment, or concluding that they were always incorrect, or even just abandoning their convictions due to simple opportunism. The left's successes ended up being personal and generational, rather than being a success of its ideas. These it gradually discarded. Altogether, it constitutes something like a failure within a triumph, or rather, a triumph within failure. Perhaps it could be said that part of the left's ideology demonstrated itself to be surprisingly suited to the needs of capital, Those exhibiting this tendency are so numerous and, moreover, spread all over the world that simple moral condemnation is unable to really grasp the scale of the problem. It seems then that generational thinking has ended up having more impact than the specific politics of the new left. A generation that had great dreams ended up defending the very limited politics of today. Moreover, generational thinking may actually be complicit with indeed partially responsible for, the limited politics of today. So, after all that, who are the boomers? How can we classify this generation in retrospect? Just ask yourself who the most prominent world leaders who are baby boomers have been. Helen Andrews. The top two, I would say, are Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. 
They are the boomers' most prominent contribution to the ranks of world leaders. And Bill Clinton and Tony Blair were around in the 1960s, and they were in many ways shaped by the 1960s and rock culture uh, and the protests of those times. But they exercised power in the 1990s. And it's important to put those decades next to each other because the record that these neoliberal triangulators amassed in the 1990s was rather contrary to their idealistic uh, vocalizations back in the 60s. That was a time when they made their peace with capitalism and corporate America and things like that. So they sold out without admitting ever that they sold out. And so it's important to put the 1960s, which is what the boomers would like us to think about, next to the 1990s when they were actually in power. The boomers are a perfect combination of idealism on one hand and narcissism and self-indulgence on the other in ways that are sometimes difficult to disentangle from each other. And that's the California ideology in a nutshell. And it's visible even in very superficial things. The most obvious difference between California and the East Coast in the 1980s, if you were a businessman and had a meeting in New York and then a meeting in San Francisco, would be the way that everyone was dressed. Out in California, casual wear was very much the the vogue, and people from New York taking meetings out there were in many ways shocked to find these uh, West Coast business titans and engineers and and Silicon Valley heroes dressed in T-shirt and jeans. Um, But that has, of course, since come to dominate every American workplace. And one of the reasons why is that workers are working longer hours. The whole idea that a white collar worker would only come to the office for nine to five and at five o'clock he would be able to go home and leave work behind, that's no longer the way most offices are. So because employers are putting more demands on their workers, they figure, well, if I'm going to be keeping you here till 10 o'clock, I suppose I should let you dress comfortably. So that's a great example of the California laid back ideology having a flip side that's disempowering workers rather than empowering them. And Steve Jobs is a perfect example of that. He was on the one hand, genuinely a hippie and an individualist and his time in India did shape his business philosophy. We have a computer industry today focused on individual users and a computer in everybody's lap because that's the way Steve Jobs wanted it to be. He didn't want an IBM dominated mainframe model where there was one computer in every office and everybody applied for time on it. But it has also led to the always on workplace. And that too is the way that Steve Jobs saw his business. Um, they, you know, the, if you worked at Apple, he made you there, made you be at the office for 60, 70 hours a week. That was, you know, as a baseline, even not during crunch time. So that's, that's Steve Jobs. He's both sides of the coin in one human being as is so often the case. As he got sicker, how did that play out? Well, you know, he didn't just suddenly get, you know, he got like spammers. He had lots of ups and downs. And uh, I found that he just got more and more emotional and intimate. If you looked up, he'd be crying. He would be crying about how Lee Cloud had done a beautiful proposal for an advertisement when he did the thing different hands. That emotionalism really struck me. And it also, I mean, the point of any biography, if you want to tie personality to product, you want to tie you know, the way that the person was as a human to what he did in life. And that was such an easy link to make because his deep romantic emotional streak is reflected in the products he made the company he built. So for Helen Andrews, how can the boomers essentially be characterized? 
the running theme of the baby boomers and their record in every sphere of society has been the destruction of institutions because institutions are contrary to the boomers' central philosophy, which is that individual choice is the greatest and most important thing. And institutions constrain individual choice. That's the point of having an institution. The trouble is that the boomers knocked down all of these institutions on the grounds that they were constricting their choices. And the result has not been liberation, but has been just absolute chaos. The institutions the boomers sought to destroy also encompassed the old cultural elitism. And this had important consequences for how this generation saw and used media. When television was first popularized in the 1950s, There were a lot of doomsayers, including people like T.S. Eliot, who said that it would be the collapse of civilization if this medium came to dominate our culture. And at the time, most people assumed that the doomsayers were just fuddy-duddies. I mean, T.S. Eliot, he was probably just being a snob, right? Well, in his case, he probably was. But we are now in a position to look back and check whose predictions have been confirmed by experience. The optimists who thought television would be a great democratizing force, bringing opera into every home on Sunday nights or whatever, or the doomsayers who thought that it would replace serious contemplation with essentially the methods of advertising. That is flash and lowest common denominator appeals uh, and things like that. Looking around, I think the doomsayers have been pretty well proven right. I think that people's attention spans have collapsed. I see people my age who failed to receive anything like a basic education. And it's because they are accustomed to the habits of mind formed by the medium of television. And now, of course, with social media and screens and the internet, that has just been accelerated. But it's all really an extrapolation of the original revolution and the original shift to visual media, which took place with television. That's the revolution that was up there on par with the invention of the printing press. People today don't really understand how resistant the Academy used to be to the study of pop culture. I know someone who is a biographer of pop culture figures on the order of Marilyn Monroe, Hollywood stars, people like that. And he recalls that getting a biography of such a pop culture figure published by an academic press before the 1990s would have been unthinkable. That would not have been the kind of book that an academic press would be at all interested in. And an academic professor trying to get tenure somewhere who devoted himself or herself to the study of Hollywood or things like that, especially in an English department ostensibly devoted to literature and the highest works of mankind, would have been seen as dabbling in something beneath their dignity. Camille Paglia Uh, not quite single-handedly, but certainly very energetically overturned that fuddy-duddy-ish prejudice against academic study of pop culture. And her work on pop culture is actually quite intelligent. And I advise everybody to go read it. It's great stuff. Because Paglia herself has a PhD from Yale and knows the Western canon backwards and forwards. However, Academics who are more my age, millennial age academics, came up at a time when they were not given the grounding that Camille Paglia has. Uh, And even when they even when they get their PhDs from Ivy League schools, they do not come away from those years of study with the mastery of the Western canon that Paglia had. They know pop culture and nothing else, which is why their work is not nearly as worth reading as hers is. And it was the boomers who decided that their pop culture ephemera was right up there with the greatest works. They think the Beatles are as good as Beethoven. 
you can almost get away with that if you are a baby boomer and have one foot in the pre-boomer era. But I think they, seeing the consequences of that revolution and the elevation of pop culture, they have been shocked. This cultural flattening was once imbued with a radical sheen before it became our total reality. Has the left actually gained anything for its questionable successes in this realm? Everybody thinks of the baby boomers as the most left-wing generation in American history. And in some ways that's true, but in other ways it would be more accurate to say that the legacy of the baby boomers in politics has been the destruction of any authentic left. The reason why the 1960s activists called themselves the new left was because they hated and wanted to replace the old left. That meant people who advocated on behalf of workers, that meant union leaders, the new left, the 60s people, the boomers, thought that those union activists and those uh, advocates for workers were dinosaurs. Uh, The hinge point in American politics was the 1972 Democratic Convention and the new McGovern Commission rules, which essentially caused identity politics and uh, niche interests and minority activism, feminism, um, civil rights activism, things like that, to replace the old pro-worker kind. Uh, And so that's really, we're all still living in the aftershocks of that 1972 convention as identity politics has come more and more to dominate the ostensibly left-wing party in the United States. And it's something you see in all the Western democracies. All of the social democratic left-wing parties have now come to be rather curiously dominated by people with college degrees rather than without them, which has left working class people who don't have college degrees somewhat politically homeless. So that's the real record of the baby boomers. And it does lead to polarization because that's the consequence of this new left style of politics, which again is transformational rather than transactional. The contemporary world is clearly not what the new left had intended to create. But then what actually happened to its more romantic aspirations? I think there's different ways that people think about it. Some people think that was defeated and over, or that right-wing people think it was nihilism, of course, and just, you know, a horrible thing. I completely disagree with that. Jeffrey Alexander. I mean, I think two, two related things happened. One, of course, the utopian and revolutionary possibilities were denied. I don't think it's possible to actually institutionalize the romantic imagination through any kind of social system, socialism, communism, anything. I mean, yes, you could have, we could have made, not, we we couldn't have, but there could have been a revolution perhaps. Maybe there was almost one in France because they had the communist party and the working classes. But after 10 years, it wouldn't be this beautiful utopia anymore. It would be a a more egalitarian, perhaps, perhaps also a more repressive social system. But, I mean, I think all of us felt a massive disappointment and confusion. Some people went into transcendental meditation and Eastern religion, uh, became mystics. Other people became neoconservatives. I knew people then who became extreme right-wing ideologues who have continued to influence the United States. But I think for a lot of us, the romanticism and the sense of justice and moral outrage against uh, domination, it kind of uh, metabolized into a different understanding of authority in the, quote, real world. It metabolized into a sense that we wanted still to create an inclusive, anti-macho, anti-chauvinist, anti-racist kind of, you know, national or global community that would have much more intense experiences of solidarity and brotherhood and sisterhood. And I believe that this group had 
we had a long march through the institutions of the United States and other Western societies. And I think that the U.S. became, I mean, it always was, but it became intensely polarized over the last 50 years between our generation, well, my part of our generation, and the backlash, which was also part of my generation, which I didn't see at the time. I've read much more about it since then. So I think that's what's continued. And Trump is, you know, Trump is my age. He's a year older than me. He hated what was going on with with people like me. We had to abandon the utopian expectations of a completely different kind of society. I believe that we carried through a new understanding of gender, race, uh, and authority. We changed the way we brought up our children. We changed the way we thought of organizations. The baby boomers are now somewhere between 57 and 76 years old. Whether the boomers' revolt was defeated or whether it ironically succeeded, because its values were always capitalist values, depends on how you characterize that revolt in the first place. Do you place emphasis on its narcissistic individualism, as Helen Andrews does, or on its collective resistance to functionalism, as Kristen Ross does? Either way, the loss of the optimistic spirit that the boomers wielded should be lamented. The unedifying battle between millennials and boomers today gives voice to a society whose horizons are much more restricted and where generational conflict stands in for competing visions of the future rooted in dreams of freedom. Where previous generational cleavages were about values and outlook, today they seem perverted, degenerated forms of class division, of struggles over limited resources. Millennials blame boomers for having had access to a looser property market, while boomers admonish millennials for not saving. Is this not something of a middle class debate, about middle class kids not having what they felt they were entitled to? This conflict is also incredibly backward looking. It should be stated that the 1960s weren't all that great. After all, the radicals of that era were pretty clear in their denunciations. So it's a shame that that period could appear to us now as some sort of utopia. How should we look back to the 60s generation then? And why do millennials hate boomers? I guess there's the feeling that we have taken up too much of the oxygen in the room, that we're whiners, that we are too self-indulgent. I don't know. I mean, I think I have two sons who are 37 and 40. So I, I see that they've lived a very different life. And I've been fascinated by it. They've never had the experiences of utopian romanticism. But they've, they have moral occupations and they are responsible, et cetera, et cetera. I have the feeling, yes, that they're trying to avoid what they see as the excesses of my generation. And I think that's probably a good idea, given the limited possibilities that are available to them. So maybe millennials want to avoid the boomers' excesses, but at the same time, they seem keen to repeat some of that experience. It first struck me how much the millennials had reduced the boomer mindset when I noticed back in high school that the rebellious kids in my class, when they were smoking cigarettes behind the gym, If you looked at their jackets and messenger bags, the patches that they had celebrated bands like Pink Floyd and Black Sabbath. So the millennials who were trying most to rebel against their parents were still listening to their parents' music. And that's, I think, a psychological fact. It's the people who most hate their parents and rail against them who end up turning into them. And you certainly see that with millennials. I was writing the finishing touches on my book manuscript over this last summer as I was watching Cities Across America burned down. And it was very obvious to me, I think not just because I was working on a book about baby boomers at the time, but just obvious that the millennials and the Antifa activists on the street were trying to have their own 1968. And why not? We have been taught, the millennial generation, by our baby boomer history teachers that America was a terrible, horrible place until the 1960s, and that the 1960s were the summit of American politics. America has never been better than it was in the summer of 1968, according to every, uh, according to the history that we were taught. So it's natural that we should want to replicate that kind of politics, even on college campuses. 
you see so many students who think, you know, you haven't really had the college experience unless you've had a candlelight vigil on the campus quad for something. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> you know, send somebody to search the internet to find an issue that's worth protesting about. The important thing is to have a protest because that's part of what going to college means. And that's that's the aspect of it that annoys me the most. The millennials have inherited the boomers same style of politics, the boomers same issues, feminism, civil rights, things like that. But for them, it's more about protest for protest sake than any actual investment in changing the world. So as all secondhand things are, the millennials boomerized politics is all kind of superficial. In trying to characterize how the boomers are portrayed, Jenny Bristow analyzed the media discourse, finding that the boomers are seen as alternately lucky, affluent, larger than life, selfish, and reckless. The boomers are described as lucky, and that I think is kind of significant because I suppose it's quite it's true in a way. They were born after the war rather than during the war. They came of age in the post-war boom. They had the welfare state being developed. It was a time of great optimism. And so describing the boomers as lucky um, is a way of trying to kind of capture that sense of, of optimism. Now, <laughs> the problem with it is, is it's historically stupid because it kind of then forgets that after the 60s, you had the 70s. It forgets about the Cuban Missile Crisis. It forgets about you know, the kind of quite difficult experience of the 80s. I mean, there were lots of things that the baby boomer generation went through that you wouldn't necessarily think were great. Or lucky, but they did at least have that that that, that sense of um, optimism. Uh, they talked about as large. Uh, well, that's true um, demographically, but as I said earlier, that it's important to note that there are differences between countries in terms of the size of the actual baby boom. The reason why the baby boomers are talked about as being large and as being problematically large comes back to that question of what people are trying to do when they blame baby boomers for social problems. And what they're trying to do by focusing on the baby boomers size is largely one thing, which is that they are preoccupied with the problems of an aging society. And in particular, it's not even that they're talking about demographic aging properly. There's just a fear of what would happen when you have a lot of people reaching retirement age and needing to have pensions, have health care, and so on. So, yeah, the, yeah. Pressure, the pressure was increasing numbers of pensions on these days. And the, the kind of dream that was around in the pensions policy community was whether there was an affordable level of a basic state pension that would get people that would significantly reduce meat stress. It wouldn't completely eliminate it, but would significantly reduce it. And of course, eventually, Steve Brown reduced This notion of you know, the, the problem of the baby boomers being a large generation is really kind of informed by this mindset that assumes that society's resources are just in a, a finite pot, right? And there's only so much to go around. Um, and that they're taking more than their fair share. So I think it's a very limited kind of social vision and misses other important considerations, like the fact that the uh, the baby boomers, through being large, actually did contribute a great deal of wealth to society. And I mean, interestingly enough, when the baby boomers were born, the demographic assumption was that it would be a real problem for them because they would be competing over scarce resources. And then, of course, because... The economy doesn't work like that. You had this kind of boom. And so then it was like, that was fine. But then there became a new argument that the problem was that there were so many of them, they were taking resources away from the younger generations. So it's a promiscuous argument that actually doesn't stack up. Selfish is interesting. I think this reflects two things, partly that it reflects the kind of sense of sort of individualism associated with the 60s, which was obviously there and was bound up with the development of this permissive society where people were 
you know, given kind of license and also kind of responsibility to make their decisions about their own individual lives in a much more kind of free way. But then the, the other side to the selfish insult that's held against the baby boomers is this idea that they just went and did that. They went and created a nice life for themselves and they didn't save anything for the future, right? So they they didn't protect the welfare state in Britain or that they bought these houses and then they these houses are worth a lot of money and now they're living in them and that's all terrible and that they monopolised public policy for their own interests. Now, again, when you look at what happened historically, this, this actually doesn't make sense because this demographic of people, they were there by an accident of birth. They did what they were told. You know, they got jobs, they took out pension schemes, they bought houses, that's what people told them to do. And then it's other kind of broader factors to do with the problems of public policy and the economy that then put them in this position where they happen to own a house and younger people can't afford to buy a house. So my argument is this isn't their fault, but it's kind of interesting because the boomers have been pathologized to such an extent that you get books like called A Generation of Sociopaths by Bruce Cannon Gibney, (laughs) who's a Generation Xer, I think. I think he's a Generation Xer. And uh, he's also a venture capitalist. So he's not a sort of a victim of capitalism. But he writes this this book seriously arguing that there was something wrong in the baby boomer mentality, that they just lacked empathy, that they didn't care. And that's why the world we live in now has got so many problems. And so it's a displacement of political and policy choices onto this kind of this notion of the generation. Reckless, yeah. Because the baby boomers were associated with experimentation and that's what the 60s was about. The 60s was about kind of the corrosion of the old norms and values and institutions and a more kind of experimental approach to to life. And obviously it has its caricature in the counterculture, you know, if you're thinking about communes and LSD and, you know, that sort of sense of tune in, drop out, all of that paraphernalia of the 60s. But this was a very, very, very small part of the demographic at the time. What was going on more broadly at that time was, I think, that sense of optimism and the sense that actually we could remake the world and that young people had a, a role to play in that. And that sense of um, individuals being both trusted to make their own decisions about whether to marry. Yeah, I mean, decisions that don't seem to be that big a deal to us today, but, you know, were controversial at the time, whether to marry, whether to have an abortion, whether to be homosexual, you know, these were all things that, that, that were given to individuals as choices that they could make. And there was that sense of trying to make the good society. Now, I don't think that was always done in the right way, but I think there was a sense that what people wanted to do was uh, create culture, to uh, foster debate and dissent and, and all of these things. And then now that whole spirit is looked back on from the standpoint of the world post-global financial crisis um, as the reason why everything then went wrong which again, I think is a a appalling kind of misunderstanding of economic trends and policy choices. The boomers are prominent and self-aware, so much so that they have cast a shadow over subsequent history. Are we now living in the boomers' world, the world they created? It seems so, but for how long? And what of the pandemic? As the coronavirus was deadly in the most part for the elderly, many of the baby boomer generation have died. On the other hand, it could be argued that the lockdowns were designed mainly to protect them, the elderly, who would be most vulnerable to the disease. Amidst all this discussion of the so-called lucky boomers, we should ask ourselves, what happens when that generation dies and their wealth is transferred down to millennials, and more immediately to Generation X? Indeed, we often neglect the cohort born after the baby boom, sometime after the mid-60s, This is a generation that is identified with irony, cynicism, and whatever. It's the generation of the end of history, when grand social ambitions, grand dreams, and grand narratives came to an end. In the fourth episode of this series, we'll look at the generation of the end, another lost generation, Generation X, and examine new endings and new beginnings beyond the West, when we look at the impact of the Iranian Revolution on generations either side of it, and the fall of the Soviet Union and Russia.
That's next time on OK Boonger, the problem of generations. Thank you for listening. This series is produced by Philip Cunliffe, George Hoare, and Alex Hochuli. Original music is by Johnny Mundy. This episode's guests have been, in order of appearance, Jenny Bristow, Helen Andrews, Josh Glenn, Jeffrey Alexander, Paul Gurnary, and Kristen Ross. And the narrator is myself, Alex Hochuli. For access to everything Alpha Boonga Boonga, including bonus content, original subscriber-only episodes, and our monthly reading clubs, join us at patreon.com slash bungacast. OK Boonga, The Problem of Generations, is back with another episode next week. See you then. Absolutely not. Why not? Because you're a baby boomer, and I'm a millennial. Most Gen Xers are in school during the crash. So at first, they think like, so what? I am a Gen Xer. But I came to find out that actually, the term Generation X, it has no meaning. How is eating meat racist? I'll gladly tell you. Looks like we've got an oppressor on our hands. The millennials and Generation Z have the Peter Pan syndrome. They don't ever want to grow up. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you're stealing their future in front of their very eyes. You're going to mature and you're going to realize nothing's free that things aren't equal, and that your utopian society you created in your mind and your youth simply is not sustainable. Okay, Boomer, listen up. Generational conflict is back. Boomers have stolen millennials' future. They've used up scarce resources while voting for austerity. For their part, millennials are self-absorbed avocado scoffers who rather complain than work and save. Where once the young rebels of the 1960s stuck it to the man, and by extension their parents' generation, today it's the turn of the young to challenge that very same 60s generation, now grown old, retired, and complacent. It's they who mortgaged our future, didn't they? This is the growing narrative of generationalism, the belief that all members of a given generation possess characteristics specific to that generation, which make it inferior or superior to another. Our turbulent times at the end of the end of history are generating new cleavages and conflicts, and the Generation War is one of the most prominent across the West. Welcome to OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations, a special five-part series by Aufe Boonga Boonga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. Last time, in part three, we analyzed the baby boomers and saw that whatever utopian dreams the 60s rebels may have had at the time, the boomers' real contribution to history has been generationalism. The conceiving of history and of social conflicts through the lens of generations, each with their distinct character, has a long history, as we learned in part two. But it was the boomers, whose emphasis on the special qualities of youth and on the defunct norms of their elders, who gave generational consciousness the weight it continues to have today. The boomers were such a large and self-conscious generation that they cast a shadow over those who followed. In particular, Generation X, the subject of part four of OK Boonger. Russia needs a policy that is capable of putting a stop to the collapse and give you impulse to the continuation of reforms. The gap between the richest 10% and the poorest 10% in this country has widened substantially. But what?
Freedom is important to all of us. Freedom is the right to say no. There's something kind of happily rebellious about that definition. said no, a most emphatic no, to mediocrity, to averageness, to timidity. You've said no to the rules of the game, the regulations of the day. You've said no to the conventional wisdom, no to the merely adequate, no to the limits and limitations on yourselves and others. You do not create wealth and opportunity that way. You do not create property-owning democracy that way. You're a group of happy rebels. This is an refugee, another utopia. And that's absolutely dangerous to politics. What are people are now paying a heavy price for such approaches? Just look at the price we have paid already. Fellow Americans, we're known around the world as a confident and a happy people. So while it's good to talk about serious things, it's just as important, and just as American, to have some fun. Now, let's have some fun. Rave Thatcher Reagan Gorbachev. These are some of the cliches of the era that define Generation X. Generation X were those who were in their teens and 20s when the Berlin Wall fell, and as a result, they're the quintessential end of history generation. Paradoxically, the defining political experience of this generation was the end of politics. They came of age as the Cold War between West and East, the ideological and geopolitical conflict that had structured global politics for the previous 15 years, melted away. The boomers and the 1960s signaled an emerging social permissiveness. As the boomers entered work and institutions, this new liberalism spread across society, becoming gradually less political and increasingly cultural. This is not to say that social liberalism no longer broached opposition. It did, because a new conservatism emerged in reaction to the 60s cultural revolution. Rather, it's that this social liberalism, in the hands now of the young Gen Xers, became reduced to an abstract rejection of authority. The love parade for me represents this kind of tiny moment of optimism and the almost potential of absolute freedom that was felt in the post-political of the very early 90s. Marin Tom, a film scholar and a regular Alpha Bunga Bunga guest. It was a really, really famous a sort of electronic dance music parade. And it began in 1989 in West Berlin in Germany, which was like a couple of months later, it was just Berlin. And it was held every year in summer until 2003. And it was sort of a club night, but it was registered as a political demonstration with the city council. I want to say that it was not coincidental that the Love Parade happened in Berlin. It was in Berlin that techno music really took off after the wall came down. This kind of movement was embraced by the city itself. It's kind of symbol of this new age in which meaning was meaningless and everything was full of potential. Growing up coincided with this post-political moment. I was 19 in 1995. And this is sort of the age when you perceive the world that everything is possible. At a moment in time, you know, when the zeitgeist was that everything was possible. So I think my youth coincided with the moment in time in this kind of really particular way. So I grew up in, as a child during the Cold War, and in Germany it's quite, I think it was a bit more felt. Because, you know, I, I remember going on demonstrations with my parents against Ronald Reagan's Pershing rockets. It, it sort of felt as if politics was going towards something and it didn't look good. There was a lot of tension and it felt quite unsustainable. And then in the sort of mid eighties, this kind of perestroika happened. And to, to me, because I was growing up with this, it, it felt like a permanent process. So the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall that felt just basically like a natural historical development to me. And so the, this development wasn't quite as big a shock to me as it was for my parents. 
who were completely lost, you know, like, like the left as such was lost. All leftist organizations were dissolved. So my parents were members of the German Communist Party, dissolved. When I was a teenager, I was a member of the Communist Youth, dissolved in 1990. I mean, even the RAF dissolved in 1990. What was also felt that there was kind of a tension gone, as if you removed like a tight belt. And this was a kind of unique feeling that there was absolutely no context anymore. This first moment where you could feel, I think, absolutely and utterly free. Every matter, so from getting East Germany to be like West Germany, to the regulation of public life, that, that was already solved, that problem. You didn't need extra bureaucracy. You would just do what's logical. You would just let history take its course. So you don't need politics, but also, and I think this is really important, you don't need authority. And this is what I want to emphasize with this, this feeling that there was the potential for freedom in this kind of, we don't need any kind of context and that also means authority, regulation, anybody telling you what to do, it will all solve itself. The love parade itself saw itself outside politics. You know, it, it really resisted any kind of de definition. Nobody knew it wasn't a demonstration, was, was registered as a demonstration, but it wasn't. Was it a celebration? Was it a display? Was it just a carnival? It didn't do any of these, you know, it resisted all of these kind of definitions. And even that they called it love parade in English, Radstedt Liebesparade is kind of important because um, people always think, oh, you, you adopt a foreign language word to make things more clear. But actually, it was adopted to kind of resist meaning. We now know that, however it felt at the time, for many people, the end of the Cold War did not, in fact, represent an opening of new political horizons. Generation X were the children of the boomers, either literally or metaphorically. Thus, the Xers inherited the failures of the boomers. It was the defeat of the boomers' radical hopes that shaped the ensuing world of the 80s and 90s. Culture came to take on an ever larger role. By the time the Berlin Wall fell, the counterculture, that had seemed so vibrant and political in the 60s, was little more than an affectation, a style. After the fall of the USSR, there were no meaningful political options left. There was a shrinking of political space to the center and the lopping off of radical alternatives. Capitalism triumphed and many Gen Xers would thoroughly embrace it as a result, even if alt culture strove to demonstrate its distance from the mainstream by declaring, whatever. I was like, what's going on? You know, like, full on Keanu Reeves, like, I, what's up? Stock market's crashing. Well, that's fine. I'm a creative. Who cares? I listened to some of it. The first couple of songs were pretty good. The fourth song, Rate Me, I was not too happy with that song. I found it kind of offensive. To reach not the point where one no longer says I, but the point where it is no longer of any importance whether one says I. We are no longer ourselves. Each will know his own. We have been aided, inspired, multiplied. Un des gestes de la déconstruction consiste à ne pas naturaliser, à ne pas faire comme si ce qui n'est pas naturel n'est pas naturel. In the words of Rich Cohen, an editor at Rolling Stone and Vanity Fair, and a Generation Xer, we'd seen what became of the big projects of the boomers, as that earlier generation had seen what became of all the big social projects. As a result, we could not stand to hear the utopian talk of the boomers, as we cannot stand to hear the utopian talk of the millennials. We know that most people are rotten to the core, but some are good and proceed accordingly. The end of the Cold War meant the fall of dictatorships, East and West. In the space of a few years, dictators and authoritarian systems that had been in power for years, and sometimes decades, fell in rapid succession. In Romania, Nicolae Ceausescu and his wife were executed on public television. I ordered my men to set the machine guns on automatic fire to make sure we wouldn't miss. 
fired 29 cartridges in three rounds. The first one hit Nikolai in the knees, and the second in his chest, and the third round hit Elena Ceausescu. In East Germany, the dour hardline leader Eric Honecker was ousted. In South Africa, a whites-only referendum granted one person one vote. There was a lively atmosphere at a school in Arcadia, where President F. W. de Klerk and his wife Marika brought out their votes. A smiling Mr. de Klerk told the Board of International Newsmen that he was optimistic about the result. Uh, is ja. Is he optimistisch, Mr. Klerk? Ik is optimistisch. Ik denk dat het goed gaan. Hier is wonderlijke enthousiasme. En ons krijg je terugvoering dat die mensen vannacht stem, flink stem en enthousiastisch stem. A last-ditch attempt to save the USSR through a military coup failed. And in a harbinger of what was to come, the U.S. invaded Panama to get rid of their very own ally and anti-communist military dictator, General Manuel Noriega. Noriega declared his military dictatorship to be in a state of war with the United States and publicly threatened the lives of Americans in Panama. That was enough. General Noriega's reckless threats and attacks upon Americans in Panama created an imminent danger. As president, I have no higher obligation than to safeguard the lives of American citizens. And that is why I directed our armed forces to protect the lives of American citizens in Panama and to bring General Noriega to justice in the United States. Yet, looking back at that era, it's not especially remembered as a wave of freedom crashing around the world, but rather the beginning of globalized neoliberalism. There is one thing which I, I really find very difficult to find precedent for. Alexei Yurchak, professor of anthropology at Berkeley and author of Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More, a study of the last Soviet generation on the dramatic change without revolution that swept through the USSR. And that is the experience of this unexpected collapse. Even during the reforms of Perestroika, which were themselves quite unexpected, when Gorbachev started talking about the reforms, no one quite believed at first that there is some kind of transformation going on because this rhetoric was familiar. And then something started changing really, like on the level of discussions uh, in the media. The, the whole Soviet history was being critically reassessed, and that was completely unprecedented. And then there was like a whole wave of this new unprecedented discoveries going on from around 1987 until 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. But still, even within that period, there was no expectation that the state will collapse and that there will be a total new liberal void in its place. Personally, I'm not a great historian. So I'm sure people will say, come on, there are presidents like this in history. I find it very difficult, especially in the modern times when we had modern sciences like sociology, anthropology, political theory, political philosophy. In the modern times, this kind of unexpected total tectonic shift, which is very fast and which happens around you and it just leaves you totally like flabbergasted, I cannot really find precedent for. So I think in some ways there's something unique. Of course, every revolution is in some way unique. But I wouldn't call it a revolution because it happened from the reforms of the state itself. It's st the state kind of undid itself unwittingly without planning to because it undermined the very foundations, the philosophical foundations on, on which it was standing. And it became unsustainable in the end. It just collapsed. That is something really remarkable. 
I find it remarkable. And I really don't think it is similar to revolutions in that way, because revolutions happen with movement. A lot of the masses are involved in the movement from below. There was an element of that in the end, but they were not the instigators of the change. It's like uh, people who wrote about Hungary, for example, Istvan Ref, the famous historian. He said that it's, it was like a revolution which happened without there being a revolution. So people were basically standing and looking around them. This thing was happening and the revolution was presented to them in a way. So uh, they were almost like spectators and then they were caught up in it. Generation X were Margaret Thatcher's and Ronald Reagan's children. They were young when Thatcher and Reagan came to power in the US and the UK. These two countries would become the global heartlands of neoliberalism, seeing enhanced privatization, and more importantly, the annihilation of domestic organized labor movements and the expansion of market organization to new social domains as the market was elevated to being the premier model of social organization and efficiency. By the time this insurrection against the old welfare state consensus had ended, everything looked and felt different. I think Generation X is a really fascinating one. Jenny Bristow, sociologist at Canterbury Christchurch University and the author of a number of books on generations, including Baby Boomers and Generational Conflict, and most recently, The Corona Generation, co-written with her teenage daughter. When we're being real about the concept of generation and the labels and where they come from, you know, um, I think the, the fact that it's named after a, a novel by um, Douglas Coupland, who's a Canadian novelist who wrote a very zeitgeisty and really kind of wonderful novel about middle class kids in, um, in the States sort of drifting around aimlessly. And this title kind of caught on, right, because it seemed to give expression to that sense of I mean, at the time, it was, you know, the, the end of history, you know, the the end of the Cold War, the sense of, you know, the, the big arguments of the past had, had gone. There was no politics. There was no kind of real sense of what to fight for or purpose. Um, I think Generation X also caught on because um, it was a time of a demographic dip, you know, in the birth rate. So uh, which is kind of to do with the availability of contraception and abortion from the early 1970s. And so you, ha- you did have this sense of a very small generation um, that was kind of defined by its non-existence almost. That was the, the way in which it was talked about. Now in Britain, I don't think I ever thought of myself as Generation X. Um, I mean, in Britain, I thought of myself as one of Th- Thatcher's children. And again, this is wh- where you have kind of different cultural experiences. I was born in 1975. The Conservative Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, was elected in 1979. I kind of grew up with Thatcher, who was a very divisive, uh, controversial figure. And in Britain, that sort of, yeah, your experience of Thatcherism really marked out what your experience of the 1980s was, you know, and, and how you viewed things. So I suppose what I'm saying is, well, I never did growing up identify as Generation X itself. Um, And what I think is kind of interesting is how the meaning ascribed to Generation X, I think much more than the baby boomers or the millennials, has been really fluid. It's kind of changed as time has gone on with people wanting to kind of look into this generation and see what see what they want to see. Josh Glenn, a semiotician and author, constructed a novel periodization of generations based on the cultural products of each cohort at highlowbrow.com. Yeah, so I'm born in 67, and we were called Generation X, which I then realized through my research, that term was invented by the generation above me. So people born from 54 to 63 were the ones who started calling themselves Generation X. So Douglas Copeland, right, had the novel Generation X and Billy Idol was in the band Generation X. And there's some other examples of that phrase being bandied around by those people that age. And they were using it as a kind of snarky way to signal, hey, we're not boomers. Even though you, everyone claims we're boomers and no one's ever going to let us not stop being called boomers, we don't feel like boomers. We feel like an unnamed generation, Generation X. And they didn't like the boomers. They thought the, the boomers were, you know, narcissistic and hippie-ish and all these things that the young, you know, people in, in 54, 63 is a very cool generation. The, what I call the OGXers, they gave us hip hop, they gave us punk, they gave us zines, they gave us DIY, an amazing, amazing generation. 
And so I felt like I should give them back the title of Generation X. So that's why they're the OGXers. My generation I've called the Reconstructionists. And as I think about patterns among interesting creative types from my generation, I feel like we tend to be um, people who brood over cultural fragments. So we get handed this kind of shattered culture. You know, we're not gonna, we're not like gonna be a heroic generation like the boomers. And so we just have all these like bits and pieces of old cartoons that we grew up watching and, you know, magazines and TV shows and movies and we like, and you know, music. And what we have been good at is kind of remixing, mixing, you know, playing, playing with that and brooding over these fragments and, and remixing them. So you think of like the Beastie Boys or Beck or DJ Spooky, like how intense they are about sampling. They didn't invent sampling, but they, their use of sampling became this amazing kind of art form of like self-referential, funny, do you get the joke? You see what I'm doing here kind of a thing. I think of like Wes Anderson and his set design, you know what I mean? Just kind of these cobbled together, amazing um, looks at his movies. I think of like Spike Jones or Quentin Tarantino, how in their um, super referentiality, pop cultural referentiality of their, of their movies, even like artists like Shepard Ferry or Chip Kidd, how, you know, it's almost always t- grabbing something from somewhere else and then playing with it and making it your own, but it's not, it's not about making your, the original image. You know what I mean? On the other side of the Cold War divide, what did Soviet Gen Xers encounter with the end of Soviet autocracy? The fact that uh, democracy, which came when the borders opened, you could suddenly travel, which you couldn't do before, especially to the West. Alexei Yurchak again. That you could do a lot of things with your life, right? You didn't, you were not really fixed. That that democracy actually came with the market. The realities of the market, especially the unregulated, totally shock therapy market of the 90s, created so much unfreedom for people. I actually went to study in graduate school in the US. So I seized the moment and I was in a different context. But a lot of my friends, when I came back every summer to St. Petersburg, they were basically saying that we couldn't, we cannot travel anywhere anymore. We used to travel to the south on the Black Sea in the summer. We We cannot afford it anymore. Everything has become so expensive, prohibitively so. And then eventually, some people really did well, some not. For the young Gen Xers, or maybe older millennials, what some people in the US called Xenials, even if such a concept doesn't apply to Russia, for this cohort, who were not conscious of the transition around them, how did they come to interpret what had happened? So I think within that milieu, the new generation of 30-somethings now, who are, I think, the first post-Soviet generation, strictly speaking, because they were born in the late 80s, maybe early 90s, right? Just at the time of the collapse. So they didn't really experience life in the Soviet Union as independent young people. For them, I think that experience of the very radical market reality created conditions when they, they started thinking about Soviet Union in a somewhat longing way, but not as a state where they want to return, but as a state which didn't live up to its promises, to its values, which were original socialist values. But maybe those values themselves can be thought of again as meaningful without that state being totalitarian, horrible, and let's abandon it, but not those values. And that is a shift which I see today. And some of this uh, pro-Navalny, anti-Putin demonstrations, which you are aware of, a lot of the slogans, a lot of organization which goes around them, they have that in mind. That suggests a certain persistence of these ideas, uh, which is not so common in the US, for example, where I live. Because uh, even though there are leftists, there's still high individualism, this incredible belief in this local or even personal responsibility. It's not quite like this in Russia. So what had Yurchak's generation actually hoped for at the end of the Cold War and at the end of the USSR? What you thought was that freedom will come, but with freedom, that basic social provision, right, which the state provided, also disappeared. So what I think my generation dreamt about was socialism with democracy. They thought this is Western life. For them, this was how they imagined. I know the question, another question is how we imagined life in the West. This is, is exactly how it was imagined. It was just the same kind of state on only free, democratic, open, right? So they didn't expect the market to be this extremely 
problematic thing, which can create this total rift and this super rich oligarchs and super poor masses. They didn't expect that. So that was part of the life in the Soviet Union that you didn't really have to worry about a lot of things. And then within that, you were free or unfree, depending on your activities, to do certain things. And then you will find different areas where maybe the state will not control you as much. To give you an example, this different rock group uh, movements uh, in Leningrad, for example, uh, where I was living, they were kind of living in these gray zones because they were not completely allowed, not completely suppressed. It's not like someone would not allow them to play at all, but they were not allowed to make money playing. They were not allowed to play. In, there were no clubs unless they were state-owned ones. But they could, could create a certain vibrant subculture, and it did emerge in the uh, late 70s to all through the 80s, precisely because they didn't have to care very much about money. They didn't have to care very much about apartments. They didn't have to care about food. All of that was there. Maybe you could have a much better quality of life. And if you didn't care about that, you wanted to just have freedom. You had a lower quality of life, but this was there. You didn't have to uh, really do much for that. So that aspect uh, is gone completely. In the West, Gen X had matured under the leadership of an earlier generation, the 68ers. James Callaghan, the Labour Prime Minister defeated by Margaret Thatcher in 1979, was the last British Prime Minister to have served in World War II. Thus, Thatcher helped to usher the so-called greatest generation out of political office. In the US, Republican President George H.W. Bush, a veteran of the Pacific War, was replaced in 1993 by the Democrat Bill Clinton a draft dodger who had fled conscription for the Vietnam War by taking up a Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford University. Bill and Hillary Clinton in particular were shaped by the civil rights era and the anti-Vietnam War protests during their university days in the 1960s. Their ascendancy inaugurated the global rule of the 68ers, the radicals of that earlier generation. Daniel Cohn-Bendy, the charismatic student leader of 68 in France, once known as Danny the Red, was elected to the European Parliament in 1994. The new era of neoliberal social democracy that emerged from the Clintonite Democrats in the US and Tony Blair's new Labour in the UK signaled the accommodation of earlier defeats, the trimming of the faded ambitions of 1968. At the same time, the claims of the old left to transform society were now pressed back into service but to the ends of neoliberalism rather than socialism as the new social liberalism provided the modernizing rationale for the global capitalism that would sweep away fusty old traditions. In this new world, culture increasingly looked backwards for inspiration, in what might be called retromania. We're now familiar with endless remakes, the ever faster recycling of fashions of decades past, and the sense that there are no new narratives or stories to tell. Did this cultural pattern actually begin with Generation X? begins in two places. One is with the boomers who won't let their own kind of childhood and, you know, teenage and 20-something experiences ever go away. Josh Glenn again. So, like, all the TV shows I watched when I, when I was a kid were, or movies I watched were about how great it was to grow up in the 50s, you know what I mean? Um, sometimes they were, like, a little ironic or dark about it or, or whatever, but it was generally this idea that, like, it was paradise to be a boomer. So, and we're still kind of constantly reliving the boomers fantasies and we have people like Steven Spielberg and, you know, George Lucas is kind of constantly giving us the same stuff over and over again, boom, these boomers. However, yeah, my generation, I do think kind of tried to creatively remix kind of handed down fragments, which is like the beginning, the thin edge of the wedge of then this problem, this recursive problem that we do have in our culture where you just somehow aren't allowed to, you can't get funded if you want to make something new. Everything has to be a reboot at this point. I think that <clears throat> generation, you know, reconstructionist artists that I'm, that I'm talking about were kind of doing it in a kind of ironic and parodic and what at the time seemed very interesting way. Um, and now it's just become kind of a, a money-making way to you know, never come up with anything new. Of course, the end of history looked different in different places. In Russia, you know, um, because that rupture happened uh, on the level of the social organization, right? Alexei Yurchak again. A lot of the expectations which people had in their 
lives, people who uh, grew up like myself before the collapse. Uh, I was still young, I was in my 20s, but um, already an adult, already past college, already with a career. It felt like an incredible utopian freedom suddenly, because it was like everything, anything went, anything goes, basically it was. Uh, and for some people it was really good, but for others it was, it created this massive uh, poverty in the country, because people basically lost all their assets, all their links, all their social infrastructures, jobs, friends, because suddenly it, it became this hyper liberalism, everyone for themselves, everyone is basically responsible for their life personally, for everything, for children, for school, for everything. I think some of the values of the social state, of the state which provides and cares and is responsible for background existence, uh, these values actually persist in Russia to this day. And a lot of the younger people in their 30s, uh, late 20s, early 30s, who are my friends, I know quite a few in Petersburg, in Moscow, in Novosibirsk, they tend to be, many of them now turning in their politics to the left. In the Middle East, the defining conflict of the late Cold War was the Islamic Revolution in Iran, which submitted religious for secular political transformation. The bloody Iran-Iraq war followed shortly after. The Islamic Revolution signaled the emergence of a new kind of ideological politics, one that was born from the defeat of the politics of earlier generations, namely that of secular modernizing nationalism and leftist revolution. There was a revolution in Iran, as you know, in 1979, and the government that followed was a, was a massive rupture in Iranian history, and the revolution was shortly followed by war, and the Iran-Iraq war, which lasted from 1980 to 1988. Arash Azizi, historian of Iran and the Arab world at New York University, describing the Islamic revolution in Iran. There is a, let me just say that there's a beautiful song called uh, The Eighties, if you, again, the 60s in the Persian calendar, by Mostan Namju, the sort of great musician of, the great musician of my generation, in a sense, I, people of my generation listen to him. Um, and it really, it's a beautiful collage that goes through what it means to have lived through the 80s. And he says somewhere that he, basically he wrote the song for those who were born in the 1960s. It was who in the 1960s and they were young in the war years. So what were the characteristics? Well, if you're a young man, of course, you, there was a chance you could go to war and fight and die. That's one obvious characteristic, but we're talking about the, the, the meaning of it for the broader society. It had a few characteristics. First of all, you had a, repressive revolutionary society that had come to be in 1979 and that in the 80s, it was much more repressive and revolutionary, quote unquote, i.e. directly after its revolutionary growth than it would be in the years to come. For instance, uh, you know, the enforcement of Islamic whaling, hijab, was much more strict in the 80s as it was even a tyrant men. So I've heard the stories that, you know, if you were a man and you wore wore short sleeves in that case, they would put your hand in color, right? So they were very much more strict than what would come later. So and if you're from my generation, born in 1988, people always tell you, well, you don't know how good you have it, like compared to what you did through the 80s. The other thing as part of the same thing was the society had very few relations with the outside world. TV, media were very limited. You know, there were a couple of channels on TV. They showed very little except sort of religious ceremonies and then imported animations. So if you're from, if you're from the 60s, if you lived through the 80s, uh, you have this almost nostalgic view now of a sort of a few low quality programs that, that TV would show and that that was your sort of only connection uh, to the outside world or, or your only cultural entertainment. And as you can imagine, there is a nostalgic sort of cult that has grown since about even some of those low sort of quality imported animations. Animations were important because they were the only Western product, Western or Japanese product in which, you know, there was no naked woman basically. Um, so they could, you know, they could use the animations. So, but what is fascinating is that there continues to be a culture on the 80s, as I said, which explains the song by Mohsen Namju, which I started talking about, that there is a, people go look at it, back at it uh, as this sort of era that was also so different from the 80s around the world, which is associated with many different things. And the last thing I'd say is that the 80s was also a decade in which 
the, is, the Islamists who were leading the government and the Islamists in society really had true ideals. Um, you know, they, they had serious egalitarian ideas, they had serious ascetic ideas even more than egalitarian, I, you know, sort of poverty worshipping, if you will. And um, that's in sharp contrast to the capitalist reconstruction that happened in the 90s and, you know, the corruption that would come later. So even if you don't like the government, if, even if you're sort of opposed to the ruling ideology in Iran, you sort of look back at the 80s and you say, well, at least those in power sort of were more sincere then and they were more um, true to their ideals. Of course, the 80s was also when thousands of political prisoners were dead. It was a decade of massive repression. You know, no one denies that. But it is a fact that uh, the kind of capitalist turn that happened in the Islamist regime in the 90s made mockery of its own professed ideals, and that wasn't there yet in the 80s. Despite this later nostalgia, the reality of the 80s in Iran was war. The Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, seeking to profit from the revolutionary upheaval in Iran, seized the opportunity to expand his territory through launching an invasion of Iran, an invasion that would precipitate a bloody and protracted war across the decade. This left a generation scarred by conflict, the so-called burnt generation. The burnt generation is a term that is used um, to describe a generation in Iran who basically lost its youth, if you will, that, that it had to, um, they had to spend its youth, um, uh, you know, not doing what youth are supposed to do, I guess, uh, you know, to have fun, to advance their careers and all that, but, but to spend it in war and, and the problems that we had in the years after the war. And there is an active debate in Iran as to who exactly is in, in the uh, Burns generation. The term burnt generation refers to those who were affected by this. I think it would make um, most sense perhaps to include in it people who were born in the 1970s. Because if you were born in the 1970s, it's, um, you know, you would have been, let's say if you were born in 1970, you would be nine years old at the be beginning of the revolution. And uh, your, um, your childhood basically went through the war. And by the time the war was finished, um, you know, you wanted to, enter the labor market and everything, uh, you would have had to put up with the uh, problems um, that Iran had after the war, which was uh, unemployment, basically a large population, right? Which, which created problems in, uh, in, in unemployment and others. But there are different debates, as I said. So, and recently there was a program on, um, on a very major sort of intellectual talk show that is broadcast out of London to Iranians, it's called Pargar, it's a BBC Persian, and there was a debate on what's the bird generation. You can see that um, there's little agreement. Um, and I guess it's not, the most important thing is not the agreement, but it's sort of the meaning of generational politics. So, but I should say that in Iran, it's very, the, it's very common to, for people to identify with the decade they were born at. It, uh, so 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, on all sort of socio, cultural, political level, this is used. Um, and I should add that, well, the actual decade that is used is based on the Persian calendar. So it's a bit, uh, it's a bit different. So um, the 60s in the Persian calendar would be from 1981 to 1991, for instance. The Islamic Revolution spawned its own version of Islamic neoliberalism in the attempt to recover from the devastation and economic fallout of the Iran-Iraq war, as described by Arash Azizi again on Iranian Gen Xers and indeed millennials. For many Iranians who had lived through the revolution of 79, whose play with the ideologies they had played with their lives. So if you were, if you were someone who had the experience of the revolution 79, you were severely affected by it. Um, it was very, it's very common um, in my family, but every other family to have people who, do, who died in the eighties, who were executed by the government um, and tend a lot, much larger number, of course, who were at least jailed for a period in the 1980s because of political activities. So as a result of this, well, it depends when you count the millennial, but there does start a period that you have a disillusion memory politics and anti-politics, if you will, which I believe it's a global phenomenon, really. Um, re revulsion to ideology, um, revulsion to politics, per se, and a sort of a pragmatic, if you will, you know, liberal mentality. So that's in relation, I want to define millennial in two ways uh, here. So that's in relation to 1979. But Iran also went through 
a very active political struggle for democracy, um, which you can say it started from 1987 when Iranian voted the reformist president Mohammad Khatami, who was a Democrat and who, um, who attempted to expand democracy in Iran. And a big period of a struggle started, which you can say it starts in 97 and ends in 2010 after the suppression of the revolutionary movement of 2009. So in this grand period, a lot of people had a lot of, you know, they didn't have, they were distinguished from the previous period because they would usually see themselves actually as sort of you know, liberal, as as uh, the people who were fighting for democracy, but um, they were, uh, you know, they were not ideological. This is the sort of thing that they would see themselves as actually, but they were still involved. But uh, funnily enough, even those who were sort of anti-ideological or whatever, they were actually fighting in a big historical battle for democratization in Iran, which was very inspiring. And I, you know, I had, I lived through this as a, as a, as a young boy and teenager. And, uh, you know, it was very inspiring because it, it was, Iran was a super political society and a very hopeful society that believed change could happen in a short period. Now, that ended, as I said, with, this, with the bloody suppression of the movement in 2009 and 10. So again, for those who come of age after that, um, and depends how we define millennial or Generation Z, but I think there's an interesting sort of cyclical almost um, relationship. Yeah. For those who came much after that, it was kind of the same process of disillusion, even less politics now. The idea of, was all about how you can make money, who you can make money from, how can you survive, how can you get by, and an absolute revulsion at politics in that level. The stalemate of the Iran-Iraq war, which left Iraq battered and heavily in debt to neighboring Arab states, would in turn lay the ground for the forever war of the 21st century. The Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein sought to punish neighboring Kuwait for having left Iraq to bleed throughout the Iran-Iraq war, leading to the Gulf War of 1990-91. With this war, the US would embroil itself in the internal politics of Iraq for the next three decades. At the same time, a former Cold Warrior, one Osama bin Laden, offered to use his own private army of anti-communist jihadis to protect the kingdom of Saudi Arabia from the nationalist dictator in Baghdad. The offer was spurned. Rejected by his own country and neglected by his former handlers in the CIA, the exiled Saudi princeling Osama would go rogue. Reality would imitate the most unimaginative Hollywood film script, with a rogue CIA asset turning against the agency with terrorist plots that would eventually lead to the war on terror in the early 21st century. By coincidence, this was the age of Hollywood's high-tech turn with the introduction of CGI. Moreover, home video brought the spectacle into the living room. The end of ideological politics was of course most intensely felt in the USSR, the state that collapsed in 1992 and which had been founded on effecting a global political and social transformation to socialism. Felix Kravacek from the Center for East European and International Studies in Berlin describes the experience of the 1990s in the former USSR. The 1990s for Russia were not, as for instance, they were maybe in Eastern Germany, um, kind of a period of general new opportunities and liberation. But the 1990s are today remembered as kind of the era of chaos and economic misery and corruption and IMF bailout and so on. So that experience of the 1990s is of course also transmitted in the families again and leaves its imprints on how people remember the time before the 1990s, the Soviet times, uh, which are associated, especially the Brezhnev era, with a certain stability and continuity. And you know, life was not as complicated as it was today and the stakes were lower and so on. That's, I think, important for Russia. Um, and this maps on to other post-Soviet countries. So in Belarus, for instance, the generational divide between 18 to 24 again, 1830 and 55 plus is significant when you ask about, you know, what's your view on the breakdown of the USSR? Young people are much more positive about that as a moment of opportunity, whereas older people have are more likely to express regret. Um, and that has important political implications um, in terms of, you know, what country do you consider being important? In Belarus, the older people still think Russia is a key country, whereas the younger people would mention European countries, for instance. This produced all sorts of paradoxes among the last Soviet generation, in marked contrast to the West. I think you can look at it from different perspectives. Alexei Yurchak again. The first one is on a very 
personal level, people are indeed experienced, not only because of the collapse, but also because of the final decades uh, of Soviet history. They are experienced and being very resourceful about how they deal with crisis in their own personal life. I don't know, for example, instantly go and buy hot currency and uh, or instantly buy some uh, home appliances the same day and uh, or um, not really trust these kind of banks, but always think about having something abroad. Um, so th this kind of resourcefulness, um, which is part of the experience of the Soviet and satellite state collapses probably is there. And I can see it today as well. People definitely have that know-how, or at least they are very adaptable in this way, right? But on the level of a broader perspective, just this idea that something unexpected somehow educates you to uh, see the world as a philosopher, right, from this big perspective of, a, of the meaning of life, see the world as something that is not completely set in, in its ways, that it's not, you know, again, I, I, I would like them to, to draw a parallel with the U.S., right? There's a, a profound feeling in the U.S. that this is humanity. This is what a human being is. As Americans often tell me, human nature is the same everywhere. Well, I don't know what that means. It's a totally meaningless statement, but they just believe in this. And somehow they just found this human nature. They understand it. And no matter what, we have Trump, we have this and that, we have... We, we are very politically active, but we are all politically active with this the same understanding of that's the trajectory of human history. And I think both Soviets and uh, Eastern Europeans of the socialist state, they don't have that. They are more skeptical about different systems, and uh, that makes them more adaptable as well. Um, they are not so locked into a certain teleology. Which is funny because they lived in the state which was very teleological, was going towards, towards a goal which was written on every facade, our goal is communism. And they didn't really live that reality. They lived within it, being skeptical about it by the end. we not even thinking very much about it. So they were not actively skeptical. They were just not, it, it was just a background which was not their own personal goal. It was like having a gravitational force. You don't really think of it as something teleological. It's just there. And then you live with it. So for, for Americans, I think for many Western Europeans, it is different. There's a certain understanding that this is, this is democracy, this is liberty. And I think that makes them less maybe prepared for certain radical transformations. For the last Soviet generation, the end of history meant not only a change in ideology at the level of the state, but also had striking and far-reaching consequences for everyday social life. In terms of uh, friendships also, there, were, there was this uh, social networking, which was extremely, extremely elaborate in, in late Soviet years. The number of friends and the number of interactions with them, constant, was, it was like a parallel society. That is also very much severed. So you have many fewer friends now. You don't really have time for them. You have the same kind of institution as here. Let's meet next Friday at three, which wasn't part of the socialist experience. It was just totally spontaneous. Someone knocks on your door at 11 p.m., comes in and you socialize. The socializing was part of total, total institution, constant socializing. It just cannot be sustained in the capitalist economy. <laughs> so I'm sorry, it just it just went away. Uh, and it's, of course, not completely gone, but it's another thing which I would highlight as a particular feature of socialist life, which makes it special, right? There's even a word in Russian, общение, which means, общение means common. Общение is like a common interaction, a, a commonality of space-time with other bodies. You know, you basically spend a lot of time with friends and acquaintances without necessarily having a limit when you need to leave. You just ha hang out all the time. It has a value in, in its own right. Very strange. And I think it's only possible in the kind of socialist state, which is no longer taken seriously, but it still provisions everything. And then you basically uh, carve out that existence within, which is not against the state, which is allowed and actually made possible by the state, by the fact that it gives you all these things which you don't have to worry about.
And at the same time, it's not really what the state was expecting. It was expecting these builders of communism, and instead it has this builders of this parallel society. So that was another big uh, feature of socialist life. I think especially in the last decades. You would call it now maybe by looking from the perspective again of Western social science, you could call it uh, subcultures. But I don't think that word captures it. It's, it's a capitalist term. It's a term which is good for liberal capitalist society. Subcultures, they presuppose a certain boundedness, a certain cultural set of values and interests which define the membership. And the market segments as well, I think, to some extent. Yeah, exactly. And that's not how what I'm talking about. I mean, there are elements of that, of course, but there's also something about the this open-endedness of membership and its total lack of necessarily one topic. This abshinia, this interaction, this commonality with people when they spend hours together can go in different directions. It doesn't have to be about rock music. It doesn't have to be about collecting stamps. It can be about just being together. Even more ironically, it was the ideals of classical socialism that were invoked by Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev in order to legitimate his attempts at reform in the late 1980s. These ideas in turn laid the ground for the dissolution of the USSR. So it ended up that the retrospective appeal to the democratic legacy of classical Marxism and socialism dissolved the legitimacy of the autocratic USSR and thereby laid the ground for the liberal capitalism that would follow. In some way, uh, by the late perestroika, the discursive transformation undid the foundations of the system. Alexei Yurchak on the period of Soviet reform known as perestroika and glasnost. The ability to ask questions, to discuss them uh, on TV, shifted the consciousness completely. Um, However, the introduction of that whole reform happened from the top, and no one quite, like when Gorbachev opened the glassness, which is uh, openness, uh, glass means to gloss in English, it's voice. He opened voiceness. He opened a possibility to discuss topics which were not discussable before. And he thought that that's going to make socialism more democratic and more vibrant. But in fact, it undermined the system. Uh, So I think that is the first thing which needs to be in place, something from the top, right? in order for the shift like the one I'm describing to happen. Is there then a possibility for a parallel situation today in Russia? There is a parallel in that um, there is a very open discussion in different parts of the society now in, in, in Russia, now not the Soviet Union in Russia, that this is completely uh, illegitimate kind of a system, right? That it probably will not reform itself. It has to go. It has to transform. It's just ridiculous. On that level, it's similar to the late perestroika years. But as I said, the, uh, the conditions of reform are not really introduced by the state. There's no this benevolent guy like Gorbachev who wants, who talks to you on live TV, which no one ever did before, and says, you know, my dear citizens, we need to inject some democracy. We need to make socialism what it always planned to be. You know, I, I don't hear that. Uh, therefore, I'm very skeptical about this desire to foresee what will happen by drawing the parallel. I think it's going to be very different. But I do see the, that uh, internally the system is already uh, ripe for change. And it's actually going, when it happens, it will be very easy to transform it because people are not necessarily so invested in it anymore. Many people will have things which they don't want to lose, yeah, but... I think socially they're not invested in it. The disintegration of the Eastern Bloc would leave a difficult and dubious inheritance for subsequent generations as to how they related to the past. It also produced nostalgia, not necessarily for the authoritarianism of the old states, but for their stability and economic security. Felix Kravatsek describes the differing generational responses to authoritarianism following this period of rupture. First thing to note is that the Russian experience of authoritarianism is quite an interesting one because it's a left-wing authoritarianism, which is quite rare, right, in the kind of horizon in the universe of cases, um, kind of a progressive authoritarianism, if you want to call it that way. Um, so that leaves a particular legacy also in the way it's remembered um, in Russia. And the second point 
just for the question of generational continuity or rupture is that there is a certain kind of um, maintenance, I guess, of, of practices. By that, I mean that movies, films, and uh, movies and films, series, books of the Soviet era about the war are being re-edited or are being watched again. So the, that creates a certain continuity also in terms of the, let's call it mnemonic frames or the kind of historical narratives that are circulating in a society. It's just as, as context for this question of how much rupture is there between between generations, because then, of course, there is. I mean, if you look at the kind of the very young ones, let's say the 18 to, to 24 um, views on Stalin and the Soviet era are much more critical than, let's take the other extreme, um, 55 plus. Um, of course, older people have a more benevolent or positive view on, on, this, on this, these periods of history. Um, so just to put some numbers on that, 27% um, of people aged 18 to 24 see Stalin with respect, whereas that value is at 40% for people 40 plus, and it's then even higher the older you go. But what is interesting in these time shots is if we look a little bit at the trends, because the approval rates of the nostalgia also of the Soviet Union has risen also among young people. It is still lower than for the 55 plus, but over the last five, twenty years, we've seen an increase in views on, well, certain things were better in the Soviet Union, and we re regret economic stability, social trust, uh, friendly neighborhood ties, ties with neighboring countries, international solidarity. This kind of discourse comes up, and that is also having an impact on the younger ones, those who have not experienced anything of the Soviet Union, but those to whom it has only been transmitted through family history. I mean, the 18 to 24-year-olds, these are the millennials, um, they have no personal experience of of the Soviet Union, they've only had Putin as their leader. Um, and that kind of touches on this first point about the continuity of telling family stories, of having these narratives in your neighborhood, in your family context, and reading maybe books that your parents read, and, and therefore creating a, a mnemonic or a historical continuity. The changing shape of this historical memory was affected in different ways by the emergence of new authoritarian forms of government in the former Soviet bloc, in countries such as Russia and Belarus. One strange aspect of this post-political era was nostalgia for the old Eastern Bloc, called Ostalgie in Germany, meaning nostalgia for the East. But it was a sentiment that was particularly common and widely felt among Eastern Gen Xers. Felix Kravatsek explains what people say when you ask them about the breakup of the Soviet Union. Many of the listeners might know this famous Putin statement um, that he made a few years ago when he called the breakup of the Soviet Union having been the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Obviously, that was put in a certain political context as well, because he's then continued that Russian citizens were stranded outside of Russia, even without a Russian passport. So that was a geopolitical impetus. But still, the view on the Soviet Union was really important. And that summarized at the time a certain view and certain nostalgia, which is in Russia quite prominent amongst the general population. Um, if we then break that down by generations, yes, as, as your question kind of indicated, it is much lower among young people. Um, so surveys that have been conducted, they kind of, if you ask, well, was the breakup of the Soviet Union a bad thing? Um, of the age bracket 18 to 34, there are about 50% who would say, yeah, it was a bad thing. Whereas the older population, um, kind of 35 plus in that case, so all the others, we are nearing 80% who would say it was a bad thing in Russia. So that, that gap is, is really huge. And it's in Russia where we've got these rather positive views on the Soviet Union, the certain nostalgia. It also can be found in countries such as Moldova and Armenia. <laughs> looks very different um, in other post-Soviet states. So in Belarus, I've already mentioned that um, the young people generally don't express great regret for the Soviet times, um, so that we can also see um, 34% as reference point here say the breakup of the Soviet Union was a bad thing, 34% of young Belarusians, and two-thirds of the older people. Um, and then, of course, in the post, so in the Baltic states, uh, which were part of the Soviet Union, um, Nostalgia for the Soviet Union is the lowest. And if you look a little deeper here, um, what we can see is that today there's a huge difference between settlement size. So between young people living in 
urban areas and those living in not even rural, but kind of less bigger towns. Um, so settlements below, let's say, 250,000 inhabitants. Um, there'll be a much more nostalgic view on the breakup on, on the Soviet era and a more negative view on the breakup of the Soviet Union itself in Russia. In Ukraine, there's a kind of interesting comparison that does not explain the difference. It's not about settlement size, the difference in view between the generations, but it's the question of in which part of Ukraine do you live? Do you live in the East? Do you live in the West? Schematically, are you a Russian speaker? Are you a Ukrainian speaker? That's the most um, important factor in explaining your attitudes towards the breakup of the Soviet Union. Maybe just to add to that, of course, the interesting question always is then um, what young people think today, what will it mean what they think once they are 35 and older, right? I mean, it's by no means a given that um, the views of the 18 to 24 year olds that are so non-nostalgic about the Soviet Union will not have completely changed in 10 years times. And I think that's where um, it's really important to look at how the Soviet Union is represented, what political and cultural discourse emerges and how that maybe changes the meanings of the Soviet Union over time. Because even those young today might then come up with a very different um, picture of the Soviet Union maybe we'll find a similar kind of Soviet nostalgic view in 10 years' times amongst those who are today very much opposed to that. How does this compare with the phenomenon of so-called nostalgia in the former East Germany? Yeah, I don't think we can compare it to what we see in parts of Eastern Germany with this, as you say, the hipsterization of a particular past that, um, you know, East German cucumbers are a thing that also young people really endorse now or East German chocolate because that's what their grandparents ate and it's kind of a cool thing. I'm, I've, I'm not really aware of that going on to the same extent. I mean, there's this kit nostalgia so that you can buy, I don't know, hats and flags and, and this kind of, kind of cultural artifacts, if you want to call it that way. Um, there's a certain endorsement of this historical reenactment stuff for these theme parks. Um, having your kids play on a tank in a public space and then you take pictures of that. The children are trying to climb the tank and so on. That is happening, but it doesn't have the same kind of cult status, is my impression, because maybe that links to that question about the ambivalence. I mean, after all, young people, they don't want to return to the restrictions of the Soviet Union. You know, so they're, they're not endorsing not being able to travel. They're not endorsing um, not being able to freely choose their workplace um, or having economic opportunities. That is something they certainly like. And so there's also an ambivalence in that nostalgia is that it's, it is very selective. I mean, it harks back to certain ideas of greatness and having been an influential country and having had a, you know, a clear political power structure. And these kind of elements are, are the ones that are selected. But, but they are decoupled, I guess, from, from other things. So it's not an all-embracing nostalgia of that, of that Soviet period. And I don't see it having an equivalent. It's perhaps telling that in this discussion of Generation X, the generation of the end of history, that the world nostalgia has cropped up quite so much be it Western cultural retromania as seen in, say, the second summer of love in the late 1980s, or a longing for a certain notion of stability or of ideological commitment in the East. Next time, in the fifth and final part of this series, we'll look at millennials, that generation that bridges the global financial crisis and the end of the end of history. We'll examine the emergence of new generation wars and the myths and self-mythologization of millennials. And we'll conclude by looking at the effects on the next generation, Gen Z, of growing up with global connectedness and the experience of the pandemic. Thank you for listening. This series is produced by Philip Cunliffe, George Hoare, and Alex Hochuli. Original music is by Johnny Mundy. This episode's guests have been, in order of appearance, Marin Tom, Alexei Yurchak, Jenny Bristow, Josh Glenn, Arash Azizi, and Felix Kravatsek. And the narrator is myself, Alex Hochul. For access to everything Alfe Bunga Bunga, including bonus content, original subscriber-only episodes, and our monthly reading clubs, join us at patreon.com slash bungacast. <laughs>
OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations, is back with another episode next week. See you then. baby boomer and I'm a millennial. Most Gen Xers are in school during the crash. So at first they think like, so what? I am a Gen Xer. But I came to find out that actually the term Generation X, it has no meaning. How is eating meat racist? I'll gladly tell you. Looks like we've got an oppressor on our hands. The millennials and Generation Z have the Peter Pan syndrome. They don't ever want to grow up. Maybe the law school you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you're stealing their future in front of their very eyes. You're going to mature and you're going to realize nothing's free that things aren't equal, and that your utopian society you created in your mind and your youth simply is not sustainable. Okay, Boomer, listen up. Generational conflict is back. Boomers have stolen millennials' future. They've used up scarce resources while voting for austerity. For their part, millennials are self-absorbed avocado scoffers who rather complain than work and save. Where once the young rebels of the 1960s stuck it to the man, and by extension their parents' generation, today it's the turn of the young to challenge that very same 60s generation, now grown old, retired, and complacent. It's they who mortgaged our future, didn't they? This is the growing narrative of generationalism, the belief that all members of a given generation possess characteristics specific to that generation, which make it inferior or superior to another. Our turbulent times at the end of the end of history are generating new cleavages and conflicts, and the Generation War is one of the most prominent across the West. Welcome to OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations, a special five-part series by Alfe Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. Last time, in part 4, we examined Generation X, the generation of the end of history and the rise of neoliberalism, of the Iranian Revolution and its aftermath, and of the fall of the Soviet Union. Ultimately, it was a generation that, unlike the boomers that preceded it, did not have a strong generational consciousness. They lived in the boomer's shadow. In this final part, we turn to a generation that already rivals the boomers in the amount of ink spilt about it. Millennials. And we conclude by looking at how the pandemic may shape the newest generation, Gen Z. Millennials grew up after the end of history, with the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of communism, and all major questions of politics and society seemingly settled. It would follow that millennials would see themselves as a generation without history, or even beyond history floating above and otherwise unconstrained by the processes and narratives that gave previous generations a sense of their place in the wider sweep of history. In this political void, are millennials able to understand themselves as a generation at all? If generational consciousness is driven by a sense of conflict with and distinction from the old, what are millennials against? Or does this generation simply take on the labels and descriptions that others put on it, a hyper-mediatized generation constructed by media narrative? In this history less era, though, there were still formative events that millennials experienced together as they came of age. 9-11, the war on terror, and the invasion of Iraq that followed. With the global financial crisis of 2008, and its long-lasting consequences, perhaps the definitive event marking this generation, and indeed, perhaps splitting it in two. 
our systematic effort to dismantle terrorist organizations must continue. But this war, like all wars, must end. That's what history advises. We're all familiar by now with the general caricatured picture of millennials and its common themes. Millennials are obsessed with social media, addicted to Instagram and Twitter, but leaving Facebook for the boomers and TikTok for the teens. Not really. Exactly in what area of technology mm -hmm. are you proficient? <laughs> Snapchat, Pinterest, Instagram, Vine, Twitter. You know, the big ones. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't say Facebook. Millennials are economically feckless, splurging on avocados and expensive coffees at the expense of saving for mortgages. Mostly everything I'm seeing here is coffee and food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Outside of my bills, where most of my money goes, is food, drinks, and Ubers going out. Makes me feel like I'm throwing money away, but at the same time I'm having fun, so... Millennials are both passionate about social justice and contemptuous of their boomer parents for having hoarded up all the property stock and resources of society, leaving millennials permanently hard up. Meanwhile, they read their Harry Potter books well past their childhoods, perhaps as a distraction from the deep misfortune they face, hit by both the global financial crisis and the pandemic, disadvantaged through no fault of their own, but perhaps lacking the resilience or just the old-fashioned grit to overcome these challenges. What have millennials done to merit so much froth about them as a generation? They're a big generation, unlike the neglected Gen X who preceded them. Millennials surpassed boomers to become the largest generation in the United States, with some 72 million members. But that doesn't tell us much. Find the discourse. Who actually are they? This is not an exact science, but uh, generally speaking, in the U.S., uh, we look at millennials as a cohort that's currently between age about 25 and the oldest of them just turned 40. Former Pew Research Director Paul Taylor. So this is, a, this is a generation that is now well into adulthood. When, uh, when we uh, at the Pew Research Center, where I used to work and did a lot of generational studies when we first started looking at this group uh, 10, 15 years ago, they were teenagers just coming into adulthood. We noticed back then how different they were, not just from older adults now, but from older adults when they were that age. And we have tracked them into early adulthood and now fully into, uh, into adulthood. And uh, they remain extraordinarily different from their elders uh, across a whole range of dynamics, uh, economic, uh, social, cultural, um, demographic. For Taylor, this distinctiveness is above all resumed in the shared economic challenges millennials have faced, at least in the U.S., it is fair to say uh, in the United States, and I think this is uh, true in, in other advanced economies, in the last several decades, uh, economic well-being has shifted north in the life cycle. Today's boomers, my generation, when you, when you do all the, the squaring up for inflation and all the rest, so it's an apples to apples comparison, today's older adults are much better off in terms of income and wealth than yesterday's older adults. And today's younger adults are worse off than yesterday's younger adults. Another way of expressing this in the United States, upward mobility has been an article of faith. It's almost an American birthright. Generations always do better in terms of standard of living than the generation that comes before. There's one statistic that, uh, that, sh that illustrates this. If you, 50 years ago, if you looked at a 30-year-old 50 years ago, he or she, in 90% of the cases, had a higher standard of living than his or her parents had at the same stage of life. Today's 30-year-olds, today's millennials, only have a 50% chance of having a better standard of living than their parents had at the same stage of life. So it's not that we're we're, we're entirely on a downward mobility uh, path, although about half the generation is. What it is true is it is no longer an assumption that things always go better. Now, why is this the case? Well, I'm not an economist. I don't want to over, overstate my uh, uh, credentials, but clearly something to do with the digital revolution, how profoundly that has changed the nature of work, the opportunities. You, when you get these kinds of enormous economic upheavals, we got it in the industrial era, uh, 100, 150 years ago, it's often the case that the, the, the well-off do better and the not well-off do worse. It, ex, it, it expands economic and wealth inequality. That has happened across the board in this country and in many economies. And at least in this phase of this transition, uh, 
uh, it is better. It has been better for people already um, already established, already deeper into the life cycle. One other shorter term impact, if you think back to 10, 12 years ago now, the United States had a huge uh, recession driven by housing crisis, uh, economic collapse, et cetera. This happened at a time when a lot of today's millennials were just getting out of school, just entering the workforce, and it put them on their back feet. Uh, And it probably has put a a lot of that cohort on its back feet for the ensuing decade, decade and a half. Whatever the role technological advances may have had in generating lower living standards, we might add to it, for example, the defeat of working class movements, which we explored in part four. There is no doubt that decline has been felt as a shift in generational distribution. Millennials have a reputation for loving all things wellness. But a new report says millennials are poised to be broker, sicker, and die younger than previous generations. So why all this doom and gloom when it comes to my generation? The question of declining living standards and their political consequences will be returned to in a bit. But let's start, in quite a millennial vein, with millennials' feelings, with affect, and with culture. Curiously, there are echoes of the 1960s in the ways we talk about millennials, particularly in a common idea of specialness. They have been described in many ways as being quite like the baby boomers. Jenny Bristow, a sociologist at Canterbury Christ Church University and the author of a number of books on generations, including Baby Boomers and Generational Conflict, and most recently, The Corona Generation, co-written with her teenage daughter. In the sense of having a sense of entitlement, of specialness, um, kind of coming of age, you know, during the 1990s, which... I have to say, having lived through the 1990s, it it wasn't, I didn't think it was like the 60s, but that's now it's how it's portrayed culturally, as though the 90s was like this kind of latte version of of the 60s. Indeed, it's worth recalling a point made by Helen Andrews in the third part of this series on boomers. It was very obvious to me, not just because I was working on a book about baby boomers at the time, that the millennials and the Antifa activists on the street were trying to have their own 1968. And why not? We have been taught, the millennial generation, by our baby boomer history teachers that America was a terrible, horrible place until the 1960s and that the 1960s were the summit of American politics. So it's natural that we should want to replicate that kind of politics. Even on college campuses, you see so many students who think, you know, you you haven't really had the college experience unless you've had a candlelight vigil on the campus quad for something. It doesn't really matter. For Jenny Bristow, though, this pandering to millennials has a political function and intent. I think the millennials were really flattered by people who had a kind of a political agenda to undermine certain aspects of society, social provision for older people. So the millennials were talked about as kind of having this real sense of generational grievance, blaming their parents for everything, that sense that they were coming of age in a time where they didn't have the opportunities that the baby boomers had, right? And this argument was often made on their behalf by people who wanted to find a rationale for uh, cutting uh, cutting pension schemes, uh, cutting funding to particular aspects of the welfare state, and who were basically trying to find a narrative for why uh, the economic situation at the end of the 20th century wasn't anything like as healthy as it was in the the post-war boom. And so I'm very sort of suspicious of this idea that the millennials turned upon their parents. I don't think that that's what happened. I think it was a narrative that was put upon them um, in, in, in that respect. As much as there's a pandering to millennials, at the same time, critics chastise the generation for infantilism and for their unwillingness to grow up. You know, I think getting fucked up was uh, was a big thing for a lot of people, uh, myself and most people I know, for a long time. Journalist Clive Martin, who wrote extensively for that classically millennial publication, Vice, on clubbing and nights out, talking about the nature of millennial hedonism. And actually what we've ended up at is probably, and I think there was this belief that like, and I wrote a piece about it once. It's like, oh, when does the party stop? Are we ever going to, um, 
you know grow up because we you know we haven't got the excuses that other generations had to stop partying um they we don't have houses we don't have children etc cetera, etc cetera. and this is when you probably wrote this in my life it was like 27 or something like that and there was a real feeling of that that maybe i think that, that film the great beauty was interesting because it was about a 65 year old man but it, it was a very much like the narrative seemed to chime with a lot of people i know because it was like when does the party stop and uh, actually that kind of looks all a bit self-indulgent now because looking around me most people i know are starting to you know click back into the society's norms like quite suddenly some people who were quite mental two years ago suddenly got a kid and gone like really really straight and actually maybe everyone does just become their parents in the end actually for every person like i said who's kind of got fucked up a bit and went straight i knew a lot of people who became casualties of that depressive hedonia a lot of people who kind of sank into themselves with you know kind of downer drugs and uh you know like down in music didn't go out so much gaming kind of lost themselves in the internet and i know a lot of people who um didn't go for that hedonism per se but they um yeah this this slightly depressive shut-in side of things which I, i don't know how much of that really happened before does this depressive hedonia get parlayed into music so much of which seems to be about tonight and only tonight with a little sense of tomorrow it's basically saying the rest of the week's fucking shit, <laughs> you know, isn't it? It's saying tomorrow is going to be horrible. Today was horrible, but tonight there is a deep banality to that tune. But yeah, it does probably hint uh, a, uh, a mindset of sorts. Josh Glenn, who has attempted a micro categorization of generations according to their cultural products on the site High Lowbrow, believes millennials to be kinder, more sincere, but also, and perhaps in contradistinction to Clive Martin's account, particularly career focused. I found them to be quite an admirable generation, you know, as far as perhaps being more earnest than my generation was, you know what I mean? Like we were quite a cynical generation. I think it's kind of nice to swing back a little bit to kind of sincerity and earnestness. I feel like um, these guys are better parented than the previous generations were. So I feel like there's less, there's less bullying. They're kinder. They're open to like transgender stuff and um, you know, the idea of structural racism and it's kind of, I mean, they're pushing this the social conversation in an amazing way. Millennials think that they should have your job um, right away because they they know how to use the internet better. So they would come to the newsroom, for example, that was, I was a journalist, so they would come into that world and immediately want all the top jobs because they saw all these older gray haired journalists fumbling to use these new tools and techniques. And so that was, cause resentment on the part of the older folks. At the same time, there seems to be a pressure on millennials to understand themselves as a generation with the kind of self-mythologizing that that involves, a practice well taught to them by their boomer elders. Clive Martin again on his generation's self-conception. I think we grew up with a lot of um, these clip shows where people were talking about things uh, in documentary form about things that had only not happened that, not that long ago. So there'd be loads and loads of stuff about punk and about Acid House and about, um, you know, various sort of TV moments and um, yeah, everything, the whole stretch of that. And those two generations, they were really given a lot of airtime in terms of talking about their own childhoods, their own experiences, the moments that meant a lot to them. And uh, that became kind of like a um, like a cultural textbook for a lot of people in this country, I think. Just it became like, there became this version of British history, which was like, Okay, it starts in the 1970s with their strikes and then um, Punk comes along and then Thatcher comes in and there's a minor strike and then there's football hooliganism and ecstasy saves all the football hooligans and Acid House comes and there's the poll tax riots. It's like, um, it's a very, uh, it's an interesting history, but it's quite, it's quite a straight one, you know? And we, uh, yeah, we grew up with that mythology. Uh, and no, my generation has not been <laughs> uh, given any platform, even as the people older, you know, the older millennials, people in their mid thirties, haven't really been given a voice to um, mythologize that so much. There is something very contemporary about this drive to view oneself through a self-dramatizing lens, amply aided by social media. I think that I may be the voice of my generation, or at least a voice of a generation. Actually, come to think of it, who would be the voice of the millennial generation if such a concept isn't too corny? The boomers had Albie Hoffman, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, Rudy Dutschker, and more. 
all associated with political movements. Is um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez the millennial voice? It's hard to think of any other millennial political leaders who would fit the bill. Maybe figures from culture, like uh, Lena Dunham or Sally Rooney, or one of the many voices from the Me Too movement. Maybe we should just leave this question here, though it's worth noting that most of the prominent candidates are women. That maybe tells us something about the social change that millennials embody. But also, the difficulty in coming up with a suitable candidate might tell us something about the fragmented media experience of today, or about the lack of political movement. Millennials entered adulthood right as so many regressive social trends were becoming more manifest. They came of age in a period of flexibilization, atomization, individualization. Millennials get cast as representative of these phenomena, rather than what they are, fish caught in a net. Jennifer Silva is a sociologist at Indiana University and the author of Coming Up Short, Working Class Adulthood in an Age of Uncertainty, a book about working class young men and women. She explains that there's a tension between the usual picture of entitled millennials and the reality of widespread economic insecurity. When we think about the millennial generation, I think they're often stereotyped as being very entitled, kind of the image of, you know, kids who have grown up with helicopter parents or who just assume they're going to get like the corner office and, you know, some fancy firm right, right when they graduate college. Um, but I do think that often covers up the vast differences within the millennial generation. Uh, the vast majority of millennials are actually growing up in a really economically insecure society where they don't necessarily have the tools and resources they need to get a job in this kind of college for all sector that demands that they have gone to college and probably re requires that they have parents who could invest a lot of money in them, like through you know, private schools and extracurriculars and all these other connections they need to make it in life. Um, and so I think that we have to make sure we think about social class differences and also uh, race and racial and ethnic differences as well to think about what it's like to be a young, for example, young person of color growing up and all of the different ways that they feel that they're discriminated against by social institutions. The impact on marriage has been particularly acute. Paul Taylor again. Behavioral patterns toward marriage and parenting have pro been profoundly different. And uh, if you look at millennials today, again, they're currently aged about 25 to 40, just three in 10, just 30% of them are currently living in a household with a spouse and children. If you compare that that to uh, boomers, uh, my generation, when we were the same age, 25 to 40, 50% 50 of us were in households with a spouse and a children. If you compare it to the generation older than boomers today, 70 and 80 year olds, back when they were 25 to 40, 70% of them were in a household uh, with marriage and children. So this is a profound difference. Marriage is an institution that has been around uh, you know, for, for millennia. And uh, the, the loss uh, of market share, to use, to use the term from economics, not sociology, uh, that marriage has suffered in the last half century has been profound. It's perhaps appropriate that Paul Taylor used a market analogy there, for millennial attitudes seem to express the market-led disaggregation of society. This is happening all over the world. It's happening for a lot of different reasons. Younger adults, even into their 20s and 30s, feel like they don't have the economic foundation. Many of them still aspire to the classic you know, pattern. When you get older, you marry, you have kids. You know, that's, that's the way life is supposed to be. That was, those have certainly been the rules of the game for most of the modern era. But it is an aspiration that a lot of millennials don't feel that they are ready to reach out for because they don't feel like they have the, the economic foundation. And it is the case that they don't. So these things sort of reinforce each other, but uh, I would say behaviorally, that is by far uh, the most important change. And then secondly, um, there is less affiliation uh, with religion. Uh, there's certainly less affiliation with political parties, other, other core institutions. You know, uh, millennials get their sense of attachment, again, th through social media, where they can create their own universe, and they can place themselves at the center of it. And, Behaviorally, this is uh, very empowering for millennials. 
I think it, it creates a sense of wonder and possibility, which is always sort of nice. But I think it also enforces this wariness because, again, it doesn't take them too long to realize that some of those likes uh, aren't real. This sense of lack of trust is more than just a social media thing. It is probably fair to say that there has been a pretty negative effect uh, in terms of their their trust, in not just in, other, in institutions. They have very low levels of trust in all institutions, be they economic, uh, political, religious, etc., uh, they actually don't trust other human beings. Uh, and there, there's 50, 60 years of comparative data here where, where you, you ask questions about, you know, can most people be trusted or you can't be too careful dealing with other people? We've never seen a generation less trusting than millennials, although there is now a generation younger than millennials, uh, so-called Generation Z. I'm not, not fond of the name of the generation, but they are now in their teens and early 20s, and they're even less trusting than millennials. These negative trends are often contrasted with seemingly more positive ones. Perhaps the distinguishing characteristic of the millennials is their acceptance of diversity and openness, especially concerning gender and race. Paul Taylor again. What I would put front and center as the most distinctive trait of millennials that it, that differs from older generations is their celebration uh, of diversity in, in all of its forms, whether it's racial diversity, gender diversity, sexual identity diversity, et cetera. You know, there are a lot of changes across these fronts. In the United States, we are en route to becoming a majority non-white country, and the millennial generation is the transitional generation to that future. Uh, about 45% of millennials are non-white by, by 2030, 2040, uh, somewhere, uh, somewhere around there, the whole country will be majority non-white. And if you look at the generation younger than millennials, they already are. Now for older adults uh, who grow up in a majority, uh, heavily majority white culture, this represents a change. Uh, some older adults have adapted to it, are cool with it, some are not. And again, this plays out in political and other ways. But older adults tend to see pluralism and diversity in this country as kind of a new challenge to be confronted and overcome. Millennials see it as the way the world has always been. It's the way their world has always been. And it's not a challenge to be overcome. It is a core value to be celebrated. Now, what's driving this change in the United States has been a massive modern immigration wave that started 50 years ago, 55 years ago. In 1965, we opened up our borders, having closed them in much of the 20th century in reaction to earlier immigration waves. But this modern immigration wave, uh, unlike earlier immigration waves that were mostly white and European, this modern immigration wave has been mostly Hispanic and Asian. So it is it has changed our demographic profile. And again, the millennials are absolutely a part of that change. Uh, uh, they celebrate it, they want it to continue. And they, so this plays out certainly in their social attitudes uh, uh, around race. Same time, we've had a pretty profound change in ideas around gender, not, not just the uh, sort of women's equality, which, uh, you know, as a boomer was, a, you know, was a has been a very important change over the last 50 or 60 years, but increasingly now an acceptance of, of, of gender diversity, uh, sexual identity diversity, et cetera. Again, these, these are changes that older adults have trouble getting their arms around. Younger adults, it's the most natural thing in the world. So you, you see, for example, there was a, a survey that just came out in this country. I was fascinated to see because we, we've done surveys when I was at Pew of the LGBT community something on the order of uh, 18% of uh, sort of 18 to 25 year olds now identify with the LGBT community. This is triple the number uh, of, uh, of the full population. So uh, there are these, these profound changes across these identity markers uh, and millennials and even more so their younger brothers and sisters are cool with it and older adults are having trouble getting their minds around it. But are these changes in attitudes and behaviors really a generational matter? Are they something particularly millennial? They could also be seen as merely a wider shift in social values. To generalize, Western societies as a whole have become more socially liberal, while also suffering from less and less trust. Less trust in institutions, but also less trust in one another. And naturally, its younger cohorts 
who have been raised and come of age in this new world that most clearly express these new attitudes. Moreover, these socially liberal values, for example, celebrating diversity or connectivity, increasingly constitute the dominant ruling ideology. This would suggest that millennials aren't all that distinctive, or more accurately, that they're as distinctive as any other recent generation, merely embodying shifts in capitalist ideology that accompany capital's self-development. Why then have these values become the stuff of generational conflict, of anti-boomerism? Millennials seemingly have a fractious relationship with the baby boomers, those born between 1946 and 1964, though the term is used much more widely today. Boomers are to be blamed for everything. The political expression of millennials as a generation might even be anti-boomerism. Millennial celebration of diversity and embrace of new technologies often expresses itself as sneering towards older attitudes. But there's a more political expression to this, a leaning to the left in the hope of free education, better jobs, adequate housing, and a greener economy. This is part of a more generalized dissatisfaction with the status quo. British journalist and millennial Owen Jones recently commented on the finding that 88% of the 700,000 jobs lost during the pandemic in the UK had been held by under-35s. For over a decade, younger people have been kicked in the teeth, and that trend continues in the pandemic. It's the onslaught against younger people which fueled the rise of the left. As much as the left's enemies wish we'd just disappear, this is the main reason we won't. Two men with a combined age of 146 are the unlikely Pied Pipers of many of today's disaffected youth. I'm trying, and you're not. Do you think sometimes it's a danger that the most passionate pro-EU, pro-Remain, on Twitter, there's a hashtag FDB. They kind of dominate a lot of people, and a lot of people on the Leave side look at them in the same. Ugh. Esta vergüenza no la tapa ninguna bandera, señor Rajoy. Y no es que diga yo que son ustedes corruptos. I would like to be sworn in. Oh, all right. It's different. Probably we will have more capacity of negotiation in the European, European Union. We have said that this is a manufactured crisis. So until you do it, I'm the boss. This perspective is part of what has been called millennial socialism or generation left. This has been most clearly expressed in the left populist movements behind Jeremy Corbyn, Bernie Sanders, and Jean-Luc Mélenchon, and new parties in Podemos and Syriza, with millennials driving forward momentum in the UK and the Democratic Socialists of America. Indeed, many DSA chapters seem populated mainly by millennials, with a couple of old boomers on board, with few Generation Xers in the mix. This would tally with the idea, expressed in this series, that Generation X is the generation of the end of history, and the withdrawal from politics. Left politics, such as it is today, would then be boomer stragglers trying to rekindle their quashed hopes from the 1960s and 70s, and the new blood of millennials trying to reinvent things, albeit without much success. Uh, quick point of privilege. Quick point um, of personal privilege. Yes. Name, chapter, pronoun. Privilege. Point of personal privilege. Yes. With this left populist experiment seemingly defeated, where will so-called Generation Left go? A recent Gallup poll found that while 50% of American millennials have a favorable view of socialism, 4 in 5 had a positive view of free enterprise. What to make of these seemingly contradictory attitudes? Is their socialism only skin deep? Does this mean they're against bad crony capitalism but okay with good ethical capitalism? At any rate, this is a cohort that was formed in the post-political era, but that suddenly encountered a turbulent political scene emerging from the 2008 crash. 
It should be unsurprising then that this generation displays a contradictory and confused political consciousness. But still, the question persists, why anti-boomerism? Jenny Bristow again. I think that question of millennial resentment is a really tricky one because where the millennials, and I'm using this in kind of broad cultural caricature here, uh, where the millennials have a point is in this argument to their parents' generation that you brought us up to believe that we were special and we could have all of these things and now we find we can't. Yeah, that sense of sort of entitlement. And I think it is true to say that there, you know, there, there was a particular kind of culture of child rearing um, amongst the sort of the baby boomer generation that was born out of that optimism and that sense of things getting better and, um, you know, quite indulgent of, of, of children. And then it is true, as, as you know, millennials, you know, the, the, the cultural millennials say, you know, we won a prize for everything we did in school. And then we graduate, and we can't get a job. You know, there's a kind of a massive sort of reality smash. So I think there's a there's that sense of it. And it, what's interesting is that, I mean, I'm thinking here about a book by um, Anya Kamenet, who writes about the plight of the millennials. And she says, look, at the end of the day, we just want what you had. You know, they're not trying to set themselves against their parents. You know, the argument is, well, we just want, want what you had and it's not fair which is a bit infantile, but, you know, that that's the kind of the core of the argument. I don't really think that it's the millennials that sort of say the, you know, the, the baby boomers had completely different values or, 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 you know, and so on. I do think one thing that is interesting, though, is that the very things that were associated with the baby boomer generation in terms of radical politics, you know, feminism, you know, anti-racism, anti-militarism, and all of that, those things that sort of really stand out as their sort of political defining moments. I think it's very interesting how these are now kind of themselves rejected as problematic by younger generations of people. You know, so you have, for example, these, these rows between so-called trans-exclusionary radical feminists, the, the old guard of feminists, and, you know, a kind of younger generation who... Um, actually want to talk much more about non-binary people and talk about sort of gender. So And so you have these kind of generational skirmishes where the what at the time was seen as the move by the baby boomers to have a world that was more tolerant and equal is now itself seen as a, a, a problem. So as much as millennials might bear similarities to the boomers, where the boomers, or that generation unit that came to stand for them, thought they wanted an entirely different world to that they inherited, the millennials just want what their parents had. And ironically, the boomers, who heralded a new permissive society, are now castigated for not being liberal enough, at least according to the new orthodoxy of the day. However, any picture of millennials as a homogenous social group conceals important class differences within the generation. All millennials have come of age in a low-growth world, where asset price bubbles make attaining certain goods more difficult, and levels of trust are down across the board. But behind this generational story of unlucky millennials being cruelly denied what they were due by selfish boomers are diverging class experiences. Jennifer Silva on the obstacles faced by working-class millennials. So when we think about the obstacles that working class young adults face, if you think about it through traditional markers of adulthood, like being able to move out of their parents' house, uh, being able to finish school, afford their own apartment, getting a job, and then eventually sort of settling down, maybe having a partner and having children, all of those steps take a lot of resources and knowledge in a way that they were perhaps more obvious or taken for granted for their parents' generation. Uh, One of the main problems is that a college degree is increasingly required to get a stable job with no stable hours and enough money to live on. And however, in order to go to college, you need a lot of, first of all, you need your parents to have invested a lot in you in terms of having a resume that's competitive enough to get into a school that might offer you financial aid. Um, But you also need a lot of 
knowledge in terms of which school you should go to, how much money is reasonable to pay, you know, how do, for example, you might get sucked into a predatory for-profit college where you end up paying a lot more money than you would if you went to community college, but you're not really sure how to do it. You might not have access to good guidance counselors and also connections, like, you know, legacies that would help you get into school. Um, And on top of that, even when you think about moving out, you know, do you have parents who can help you with this soaring cost of housing, either, you know, put down for some last month's rent or, I mean, as I've gotten older, I've seen many people have their parents give them their down payment for their first house because there's no way they could afford it, uh, given the soaring costs of living. These barriers also impact the life commitments one is willing to make. For working class young people, when when we're talking about love and marriage and family, many of the people I've interviewed have kind of grown up being like the first generation whose parents were divorced. And so I think many of them still have a very nostalgic view of family, which would include getting married and, you know, having a house with a white picket fence and raising children in marriage and being, you know, being able to give their children a better life than they had. But many of them at the same time grew up in families where that wasn't the case and they experienced kind of a lot of turmoil or relationships um, maybe not lasting or having a lot of uh, trauma or pain within the family. And so they often, for me, would talk a lot about that, kind of the emotional troubles they grew up with. And this is kind of different from their parents' generation where they probably, their parents' generation likely experienced some family turmoil or tension or conflict or maybe alcoholism or joblessness, but probably wouldn't have talked about it so much. But the young people, young working class people I've interviewed talk a lot about their challenges and their emotions and um, what they've coped with growing up. So that's like one aspect of it where they're kind of bringing with them maybe challenges from earlier on, which makes them a little bit more distrustful and maybe a little less likely to jump into a committed relationship because they've seen them fail in the past. There's also a sense that commitment is risky. So men will kind of be aware that they feel this pressure, like they have to be able to support a wife and children. You know, they can't just be working at Burger King or, you know, working the night shift at a, you know, service job. They feel like they won't be appealing to women. And that also makes them a little bit sad because they feel like it's not really about them. And for women that I've spoken to, they, they also, you know, they've had to fight for their independence um, and for them, the idea that you might kind of give everything you have to be in a relationship with someone who might not be able to support you or contribute, or maybe they're controlling. It's not worth it to, um, to give up their independence. In this context, the wider question of social trust rears its head. What I find is sort of an inward turn where they're scared to rely on other people. They don't believe that institutions are working for them. Many of them believe that most institutions, whether it's education or politics, exist only for profit um, to you know benefit corporations and that they can't trust anyone and they really have to take care of themselves. And what that means is that they're not really, you know, participating in kind of forms of collective action or even really voting. Um, and that they really believe that, you know, they don't, they almost have a sense of pride. Like I have to take care of myself. And if I don't, then, you know, if I rely on anyone else, then I'm only going to be more hurt or betrayed. But that mistrust isn't reflected as deeply in middle-class millennials. I think among middle-class youth, it's different because they do believe that institutions are working for them and will be responsive to their needs. And I've seen them hang their identity much more on, you know, political organizing, getting much more involved um, in social justice movements, perhaps. And, um, you know, basically believing that they can make a difference. A hyper-competitive world is not something the middle class can escape, but they do have greater means of staying ahead. Competition need not be fatal. Middle class parents are basically coaches for their for their children from an early age. So, for example, they're intervening very early on in the school setting to make sure that their children are getting the support they need. They're 
I've interviewed middle-class parents who pay for their children to go to Cambodia to volunteer in a dental clinic, or they'll ask a neighbor to give their child a free internship in a chemistry lab that allow them to write this great essay to get into school. Um, at the same time, I've seen middle-class parents starting college savings, you know, really early, but also helping their children understand what college investments might be worth it. For example, encouraging them to take a scholarship to a public school, but then paying for graduate school later. Um, and so really kind of their parents have invested in so many experiences and connections for them that that transition to adulthood is a little bit easier because they have so much scaffolding. On top of that, I've also seen middle and upper class parents being able to use their resources to help young adults in case they start floundering. So for example, if a working class kid maybe um, starts experimenting with drugs or gets into a bad relationship or gets accidentally pregnant, they're usually on their own versus for the middle class parents, uh, middle class families are often you know, the first to get their children psychological counseling or making sure they have access to birth control, all of these investments that help them keep going even when you know we think something might happen for example if their kid has a learning disability getting tutors and making sure they have accommodations um, that kind of thing ultimately it's hard to separate class and generation in the experience of millennials it's almost like the way that class is experienced because of the generation that matters so i would say within this current generation how we, you know, maybe the things that the foundational pieces of what it is to be a millennial might be that you grow up in a uh, economy that demands college with a very insecure, risky service sector. We see a retreat of the social safety net. Uh, we see much more uncertainty and instability around family and gender um, and a growing distrust of major institutions uh, such as religion or politics. Or, But I do think that how that ends up being experienced is so shaped by class that you can't really separate them because in a way middle class people are able to maintain their class advantage because they're able to navigate all of these generational changes in a way that working class people are not. In some, is generation war today, such as it is, fought over resources or over values. We've seen at the beginning of this series that generational cleavages are historically given life by a different conception of the world held by new cohorts. But millennial values don't seem to herald that much of a rupture. The seeds were already there in the new left of the 1960s. And by now, these values are becoming constituent elements of the ruling ideology. As for conflict over resources, there's clearly a distributional inequality between young and old today that is more stark than in the past. But as noted earlier, millennials seem only to be fighting for what their parents once had. This fact would suggest that there isn't that much to the idea that this struggle is a generational one. And as class divides millennials just as it does boomers, the issue at hand appears to be a social one, which is only mystified by treating it as a generational question. We are at the same point today in looking at the millennials that we would be if we were in 1985 looking at the boomers. An older boomer, born in 1945, would have been 23 at the time of the global uprising of 1968 and would have been in their late 20s and early 30s throughout the 1970s. So, by 1985, we would have been able to make some strong claims about the nature of the boomers and their politics. So let's attempt the same today. This older millennial, born in 1980, might have participated in the anti-globalization protests at 19, and would have been 21 when the war on terror began. They may have opposed the invasion of Iraq, and then got shafted by the global financial crisis. Maybe they would have been a leading voice at Occupy when they were 31. At the start of this series, we laid out four hypotheses. One of which was that generations can be defined by more than their formative experiences. They can be defined by their political agency. We'll let the millennial record speak for itself. Looking to the future, 
We noted in Part 3 that Bill Clinton was the archetypal boomer politician and world leader. Millennials haven't reached that stage yet, especially as so much Western politics looks like a gerontocracy today. Who will be the archetypal millennial politician? Uh, Pete Buttigieg? As to those distributional questions, we know right now that the 72 million American millennials control just 4.6% of US wealth. Millennials as a whole might be worse off, but the usual intergenerational transfer of wealth will soon see a small proportion of millennials inherit a lot of that. That should surely put pay to questions about generational distribution of wealth. How will we look back on millennials in the future? Will their goody-two-shoes attitudes mean they will always be a conservative generation? Are the middle-class fractions of the generation going to be excluded from processes of asset accumulation that define the experiences of their parents, maintaining their generation-left radicalism? One way in which generations are created is through the shared appreciation of certain cultural or aesthetic products which can travel across geographical or cultural boundaries. The shared music of the 1960s seems to have had that effect back then. Today there's talk once again of so-called global generations, and events like the worldwide spread of Black Lives Matters protests seems to suggest this is happening again. But at the same time, media is incredibly fragmented nowadays, with little sense of a mainstream anymore. The case for the emergence of global generations is still unresolved. What is the role of the internet in the generational question? Jenny Bristow again. Internet is both more and less significant than is often presumed. So in terms of being less significant, one of the things about the, the, the internet is that it gives a much more uh, globalizing perspective. Yeah, it breaks down uh, boundaries in that way. And this argument was actually made really uh, quite perceptively by um, June Edmonds and, and Brian Turner, who are leading scholars on generations, actually about the baby boomers. And, and they wrote that yeah, it was the baby boomer that was the first global generation because that's when you had TV, you had a lot of events happening all at the same time. And so that um, ability to sort of see each other as a generation, I think goes back um, quite some time and it's not really new with the internet. I think what is new about the uh, internet and particularly social media, I think has more to do with politics than it does with generations, that social media has kind of allowed, well, on the one hand, it's kind of facilitated what we might call the cultural blending that we've seen with other technologies. But I mean, I think it's, it's really facilitated that. So that sort of specific sense of geographical space that people live in. It doesn't really feature so much. And it means that you can have protests that take place about something that happens with America just being exported everywhere else, even though the context is actually kind of quite different. So I think that's sort of very interesting. And I think um, also it's facilitated the creation of these echo chambers and identity politics, which... Again, I don't think that's to do with generations as such, but I think it really does sort of feed that sense of people looking to construct their rhetorical identity against something or somebody else and to get validation from people who think the same ways that they do and to perform their identity in this way. And and, and the extent to which that side of things has broken down kind of traditional boundaries between, say, the uh, public space and private space, I think does actually mean that the generations that have come of age being very comfortable with social media, I think they they do sort of inhabit a slightly different reality because of that sense of there being no, no real kind of physical or geographical boundaries. Might what we have come to see as generational conflict between millennials and boomers actually just be an internet mediated identity? So rather than millennials truly being a generation apart, with a truly distinctive worldview and political ambitions, is what we're seeing maybe little more than the performance of a millennial identity, one that has been constructed online as quote-unquote anti-boomer. Boomers then are cast as complacent social conservatives, something that is in diametric opposition to what the 60s rebels saw themselves as. <laughs> 
To really invert the picture, we might even consider that the boomers were really the rebellious social liberals and radicals, and that millennials are in fact complacent conservatives. Even if that's going too far, these questions should serve to complicate the facile generational narrative with which we're often served. And anyway, according to what we've explored in part one of this series, generations are shaped by certain traumatic events that don't come around that often. There is no automatic sequence of generations, distinct from one another and conscious of themselves. Moreover, millennials are internally split by their experience of the 2008 crisis. The older millennial cohorts, sometimes known as geriatric millennials or silverback millennials, who were born between 1980 and 1985, will have entered the job market sometime between 1998 and 2007, before the crisis. How is their experience the same as that of a younger millennial, say one born in 1995, who was 13 when the crisis hit? That younger millennial will have spent most of their adolescence with social media, rather than encountering it in adulthood, as older millennials did. For all that we may seek to junk or debunk a lot of the froth about millennials, this series has tried to establish that there is nevertheless something to the generational lens. Sometimes a generational consciousness is well-founded, and there is a certain integrity to generational cleavages. So what about the youngest generation, the Zoomers born mostly to Gen Xers from the mid-1990s until today? There's obviously little to say just yet, with its older members only in their early 20s. For some, Gen Z is already far more aware, or politically conscious, or woke, than their predecessors. Journalist Clive Martin again. I think one of the, the main things about Zoomers, I think you see a real kind of consciousness politically. Um, I think back to when I was 18, and uh, there was a little bit of like leftover leftism from like the Stop the War March in the UK and things like that. But it was quite... It's quite niche to be into left wing politics and especially identity politics. Then it was uh, it was not particularly fashionable. It, it involved going to uh, a lot of sort of uh, church halls and sort of meeting with with sort of lefty boomers and stuff like that, ironically. But this generation just so switched on to all that kind of stuff. I mean, they're quite academic in a way. Um, they, they really understand uh, and critique these assumed roles we have and all that kind of stuff. So they're obviously like. They're super aware about, you know, race and gender and sexuality and uh, politics and, you know, all sorts of systemic issues. You know, to be honest, when I went to university, it was a big party. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I went to university in central London. It wasn't that bad. But the people I know who, are, you know, intelligent people who are into this kind of stuff now, I think they just they weren't that involved in that stuff. It was it was much more self-centered. We were at that age. Whatever we may think about the content of the views Gen Z supposedly holds, it's understandable that a generation coming of age in a more politically turbulent time should feel more politically conscious. This stands in contrast to millennials coming of age after the end of history, or Gen Z who saw the sunset of politics. At present, it's not possible to say how and if Zoomers' attitudes may coalesce into political projects. But being raised with social media and immediately globally connected to the Americanized public sphere that it is, members of Gen Z may share some commonality with one another, especially because of the pandemic. What will the long-term effect of this be? Are they a corona generation? Jenny Bristow. Again, there's a tension here about what kind of label is imposed upon them and what kind of generation they'll become. People have been trying to label Generation Z for ages. Yeah, that, part of the reason they're called Generation Z is because no one's come up with a label yet, you know, because we had Gen X and then there was Gen Y, which then became the millennials. So now we have Gen Z and it's like, oh, my God, it's at the end of the alphabet. You know, there was always a sense that things were going to go badly for the Gen Z kids. And lots of attempts have been made to sort of say what is distinct about them, whether it's social media or Zoom or or whatever. Now... I don't really think that any of those things is particularly worthy of consideration. However, I uh, wrote a book in 2020, the spring and summer of 2020, with my teenage daughter called The Corona Generation, Coming of Age in a Crisis, which was about the experience of the pandemic on young people 
coming into adulthood at that time because I had this very powerful sense that actually, I think when we're looking at something that really does mean something of significance in the formation of generational consciousness, this whole past year of the pandemic and also the response to it, you know, in terms of lockdown, you know, does potentially have the the ability to provoke that distinction of the, you know, the world before and the world now. You know, it is going to affect young people. So it's not a, a prophecy. And I'm trying to tread quite a fine line here between, on the one hand, saying that I, I actually think that there will be something significant about the pandemic for the consciousness of Generation Z, and this may well provoke the kind of generational conflict or generation gaps that I've spent the past 10 years saying didn't exist. I think this moment might be one of those. On the other hand, um, I'm very keen to resist the um, the determinism that goes alongside generational lab- labelling. And I think this narrative that you're seeing building more and more now about the COVID generation or Gen C or whatever, which just is a really kind of lazy way of saying anyone who was born in this time or who was a kid in this time or came at age at this time, their entire future is going to be determined by the experience of the pandemic, I think really doesn't work, right? Because young people, as they grow up, they are making their future. They're not just sort of repositories for a kind of a horrible moment that happened at a certain point in their lives. So I think it has to be handled with caution. Some have argued that globalized and globalizing mass media and internet communication technologies are triggering mechanisms for generational self-consciousness, especially when they mediate traumatic events, such as the pandemic. But there's also an argument that ever more complex media ecosystems aren't actually that effective in conveying trauma. Everything becomes hyper-real, in which media representations become indistinguishable from reality. If life is increasingly experienced this way, do traumatic events still have the same effect and the capacity to spur on generational consciousness? So after all that, where are we with generations as a concept? Ultimately, the idea seems more applicable when talking about distinct social groupings rather than society at large. We can talk about generations of rock musicians or artists, and things map quite neatly, where, for example, the punks react against the overblown ambitions of prog rock, opting for a pared-down, direct and punchy aesthetic instead, or the concept of generations can be usefully applied to political generations. Consider the left, where a generation mostly born after the Second World War reacted against the so-called old left, creating a new left that chose to emphasize alienation more than it did exploitation. But when applied to society as a whole, when we claim that millennials are such and such, for example, the concept loses cogency. Instead, what happens is that a certain generation unit, a specific section of a cohort, comes to stand in for a generation as a whole. The image of millennials in cafes on laptops, of digital nomads unable to afford a house or start a family, or choosing not to, is what has come to stand in for all those born from 1980 to 1995. But the reality is that this image is specifically that of the urban liberal middle class, a part of society that is culturally hegemonic anyway. And so the younger cohort of that relatively well-off part of society comes to represent the millennial generation as a whole. It was perhaps always thus, as we found throughout this series. And yet, when a new cohort emerges and forcibly breaks with the old, taking the future of society into its own hands. That is, it refuses to be the passive object of social forces and decides to be an active agent, then the concept of generation takes on a new vibrancy, as it did after the French Revolution, the 1848 revolutions, or even, indeed, the generation of 68, whatever its later disappointments. Modernity is indelibly associated with youth, the new, the future. The insistence on a purely generational lens, though, 
so often presents a distorted view of society and politics. As we found over the course of this series, whether it be the striking generational consciousness of the World War I generation, or later on of the baby boomers, or today's millennial-led generation war, the appeal to generational divides has repeatedly served as a useful mechanism to avoid or evade the reality of class and class politics. Thank you for listening to OK Boonger, The Problem of Generations. This series is produced by Philip Cunliffe, George Hoare, and Alex Hochili. Original music is by Johnny Mundy. This episode's guests have been, in order of appearance, Paul Taylor, Jenny Bristow, Helen Andrews, Clive Martin, Josh Glenn, and Jennifer Silva. And the narrator is myself, Alex Hochili. That's it for this series, but for access to everything Alpha Bunga Bunga, including bonus content, original subscriber-only episodes, and our monthly reading clubs, join us at patreon.com slash bungacast. We hope to see you there. Thank you.